Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Interrogating the Political Through the Arts. My name is Shalin Rajendran, and I am part of a small organizing team led by Marin de Cruz and together with Carmen Ng that has put this event together, and we are really delighted to see so many of you here. We look forward to the dialogue with all of you. We wanted to begin by giving you a context for this event in the hope that it will provide some useful framing about how and why we've structured this session. To those of you who are already familiar with the work of Five Arts Center, formed in 1984 and now 35 years old, Yahoo, yes, you can clap. You will be aware that the company has been engaged in diverse kinds of critical conversation. And this series called Critical Conversations is just one recent phase in the ongoing work of developing critical art and thoughtful intervention. So why have these dialogue sessions rather than just focus on performance or other kinds of art making? And it is dialogue, not debate, that we seek where different opinions and perspectives can emerge to challenge our assumptions. And as David Bohm, a physicist who wrote a lovely book called On Dialogue, suggests, we come to an understanding or knowledge or truth via participation rather than abstraction when we build relationships to connect, to communicate, to interact with meaning. And that's not something that the contemporary world encourages us to do. It's a gap, even in our arts ecosystem. So in its history, and perhaps more specifically in the last few years, Five Arts has consciously set out to look critically at the gaps in the performing arts industry. And it's made efforts to address some of these. One tangible example. The company has considered the lack of documentation in the performing arts and subsequently published two books. A book of plays and articles on performance making called Staging History, edited by Kathy Rowland, and a book resulting from a conference held in 2015, Excavations, Interrogations, Christian Jit, and Contemporary Malaysian Theatre, edited by myself, Ken Takiguchi, and Carmen Ng. Five Arts has also produced and launched two archive websites that document theatre practice and pedagogy in Malaysia, Arts Education Archive Malaysia, spearheaded by Janet Pillay, and My Art Memory Project, spearheaded by Kathy Rowland. So in line with this approach to ongoing research and documentation, there's a growing awareness that while arts practitioners are making interesting and innovative work, there's a need for critical reflection and discourse on the issues and the processes of art making. Hence the need to make time and space to discuss, interrogate, analyze the doing in greater depth and with sharper focus which means allocating resources and energies to curating an event or a series and then asking practitioners to participate in this work. It also means trying to rethink how we talk with each other and suggesting new frames that might challenge us to become more open and critical, to listen deeply and attentively. The belief is this will help practitioners to create work that is more relevant and potent and the hope is that it will encourage us all to cultivate dialogue that is rigorous, meaningful, and enjoyable. So this is part of a post-conference project, because in 2015, to mark the 10th anniversary of the passing of founding Five Arts Centre member, Christian Jit, a conference titled Unfinished Business, Conference on Christian Jit's Practice and Contemporary Malaysian Theatre, was held in Kuala Lumpur to focus on how the practitioner and the scholar, the audience member and the student are involved in different kinds of responding research and criticality. And we don't often spend enough time talking with and listening to each other. And so participants at the conference commented on the need to continue such efforts and develop more sustained programs that provoke thought and inspire art. So after the conference, we started this post-conference project, and the first iteration was the book resulting from the conference, which took us three years, a marathon of effort, because we wanted to experiment and interrogate the process of making a book that came from what we think is an alternative conference. We learned a lot about what to do, or what not to do, what else to do the next time. 
and there were many critical conversations in the process, even when it came to the book launch, and if you were at that book launch, you'll understand why. So this critical conversation is the second phase of the post-conference project and the second iteration. The first was held in November 2018 as part of the Georgetown Literary Festival, titled Interrogating the Arts Through Writing, discussing two books, Writing the Modern by T.K. Sabapathy and the Excavations book on Krishan. The panelists were T.K. Sabapathy and myself, and it was moderated by Carmen Ng. And this was recorded and is now available online if you are interested. The second iteration is today, Interrogating the Political Through the Arts, and we will have a third event, hopefully on the 16th of November, Art and Dramaturgy. And we are very grateful to Yaya San Saim Dabi for funding this work and to Ilham Gallery for collaborating with us on this iteration. The format for this session is that the panelists will first respond to two questions that were sent to them earlier. And after each question, they will have time to dialogue amongst themselves and with the moderators, bouncing off each other's views, interacting and probing further. But we have allocated a full 60 minutes at the end for the audience to comment, raise questions, and we invite you to please note down your questions and raise them during this time. The idea is that the panelists have time to respond to each other, but also that the moderators have opportunity to take up certain ideas. Because a key aspect of this series is the role of the moderator, who's not just present to ask and field questions, but who facilitates the dialogue by raising key concerns and making useful interventions. We recognize this as a crucial aspect of the work because it generates a dynamic of convivial and provocative, we hope, interaction. So for this event, we have chosen two moderators, both of whom have been involved in the work of the arts and its relationship with the political for a long time. And they continue to engage these questions, albeit in different ways. And precisely because they are so different, and they occupy different positions in the landscape of the art and politics, we thought this would be valuable. Their insights and perspectives will draw from their experiences and their interests, but more significantly, they are both committed to rethinking social and cultural norms in a complex and changing environment. Dr. Carmen Ng teaches media, culture, and game design at the University Tunku Abdul Rahman and is an arts writer and reviewer whose work includes critical commentary and reflective interrogation of what it means to make art and think about how we respond to art. She's a highly respected educator, there are students here, who, and she inspires and encourages her students to take on the work of becoming conscious citizens in diverse ways, becoming aware and engaged. Carmen was co-editor on the Excavations book, and as a member of this team as well, I have grown to really appreciate her attention to detail and the way she makes links between what is taken for granted and what is emerging and often not sufficiently acknowledged. Fami Fadzil, member of parliament for Lumba Pantai, a member of Five Arts Centre and a performer who has played a range of roles on a range of different stages, has been working at the nexus of art and politics in perhaps a more direct sense for the past 10 years. His desire to make connections between the arts and politics stem, I think, from a curiosity about how society navigates these often separate, yet highly similar realms of performance making. And his own creative and political work are rooted in a conviction that it is important to be able to remain open to new options and ways of thinking and working. This is evident in GE14, his recent collaboration with Japanese choreographer Zan Yamashita, which featured in the Performing, Performing Arts Market 2019 in Yokohama. Fami's style, for those of us who know him, is one that is not just charming, but sensitive, and alert to the nuances of being a Malaysian who seeks change and willing to put himself out there in order to make that change happen. For the purposes of this event, we request that any questions or comments that are fielded to Fami, focus on the nature of this event. <laughs> and we request that the audience respect that. 
The physicist David Bohm, whom I've just talked about, advocated for critical listening and deep trust during dialogue. And he had this to say about dialogue. On the whole, you could say that if you are defending your opinions, you're not serious about dialogue. Likewise, if you're trying to avoid something unpleasant inside of yourself, that is also not being serious. A great deal of our whole life is not serious. And society teaches you that. It teaches you not to be very serious that there are all sorts of incoherent things and there is nothing that can be done about it. And that you will only stir yourself up uselessly by being serious. But in a dialogue, you have to be serious. It is not a dialogue if you are not. Not in the way I'm using the word." End of quote. On that very serious note, please welcome our moderators for today, Carmen Ng and Fami Fazil. Okay, thank you, Charlene, for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's a few things I want to say before we actually start. One is uh, this is a recorded event. As you can tell, there are many cameras, uh, and later will be online as well. So we just want to let you know that, uh, just so that you're aware if you're speaking, that you will be recorded and you will go online later. Uh, before we actually start, I want to take a moment. Uh, since we're at Ilham Gallery, uh, and this is an uh, art space, an artist space, Actually, a few days ago on Tuesday, we lost one of our beloved Malaysian artists, uh, Rosli Sham Ismail, or as we know him affectionately as Ise. Uh, he's, for those of you who know him, I Ise is a really fun, gregarious, wonderful human being, and it's a shame that we are losing him so early. Uh, but I just want to take a moment. Usually, we'll have a moment of silence um, at the passing of someone. But I think because Ise is not the kind of person who will want to be silent, he's a very fun guy, he would laugh at most things. Uh, I think rather than do the moment of silence, let's have a moment of applause or a round of applause for Ise. Thank you for that. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. Okay, so what I'll just let you all know is uh, this is a little bit of an unconventional panel. So I'm, I'm going to actually read out some of the short little summary of who will be up here as a panelist. And then after that, we're going to start with the first question, which Fami will ask. Uh, and then the panelists each will reply. Then after they each reply, we will then have a quick kind of 15-minute discussion session. Then only we'll move to question two. Okay, so it's a little bit different than what you would typically expect. So without further ado, let me just introduce the panelists. So the first is uh, Anne Lee. She's a Sabahan, uh, and she's actually completing her doctoral studies on political satire in theatre, television, and social media memes uh, for Malaysia as well as Indonesia context. She's an award-winning playwright and also writer, editor, and reviewer. Okay, Anne Lee. Next, we have Kok Heng Luan, who is the artistic director of a Singaporean theatre company, Drama Box. And for a brief moment, from March 2016 to August 2018, Heng Luan actually served as the Arts Nominated Member of Parliament for Singapore. And he has spoken actively on civil society issues as well as arts and culture issues. So he comes to us from Singapore all the way. And last but not least, uh, we have Omar Ali, who is trained actually originally as a graphic designer and copywriter. And uh, is now the resident director at KL Pack. And in his own words, he says he dabbles in a bit of acting, directing, dramaturgy, and set design. Uh, his, some of you may know his award-winning play, Kandang, which has won four awards, uh, at, including Best Director and Best Play at the 2018 Bo Cameronian Arts Awards. So if all the three panelists don't mind to come up and occupy these seats here. Thank you. 
Okay, Fami, I think you take the floor now. Hello, hello. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Carmen Ng. Uh, and uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for taking time. Uh, and to the uh, wonderful people who are part of the panel this afternoon. So I've been tasked with asking the first question to get the ball rolling. And uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward in the way that arts and politics always is very straightforward, not. So <laughs> here goes. <laughs> so all of you have engaged with issues related to politics and power structures in your work. Uh, why was it important for you to incorporate such issues in your work? And what kinds of critical framework or questions informed your thinking around these issues? So perhaps what we can do is uh, just go from my immediate left. So Anli, you have... Uh <laughs> okay. Thank you, Fami. Thank you, Common. Thank you, fellow panelists, and Ilham and Five Arts Centre for this real privilege to be here. Uh, I don't normally talk about my own work, so I'm a little bit nervous. I'm much more comfortable talking about other people's work. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, when I first got the title, Interrogating um, the Political Through the Arts, I know Apadurai have, has, you know, has referred to public culture, that this is the space where varieties of culture can contest, um, interrogate, and, and you know, be encountered. But uh, I found that you know, interrogating is actually, it, I've, it, it's quite a, it makes me a bit nervous. Uh, it seems to me that, in, at least in present context, it conjures up, I don't know, um, suicides, MACC, black eyes, um, all kinds of things which um, I think in the, in the sort of uh, time and context now uh, is very different, I'm going to say, than, than when I first um, came back. Uh, but what I'd like to do is get this little fella and show you that um, I came back uh, to Malaysia uh, in uh, <coughs> 1987 and uh, um, I was uh, I think about 22, 23 by the time Vision 2020 came about. So this brief 10 minutes is going to be a little sort of autobiographical, a little bit of distance for I can, I don't know, a little bit Saturday afternoon. So please be with me. Um, I started uh, interrogating the political through the arts from quite a young age, and this is an example of my um, early work. This is, if you note, um, the political context here is a uh, coffee morning for uh, middle, middle to upper class uh, uh, Malaysian, Chinese, and Japanese housewives in Sandakan, where um, uh, I, I lived f for many years. If you, if you notice, there's some gender perf performativity happening. There's a kind of um, uh, uh, um, cowboy sort of waistcoat. There's a bit of queering with the, I don't know, some kind of happening with the hat. But I want you to look at the um, Dracula like, um, you know, sharp, critical bite there. Uh, uh, I think I was about five years old. Um, I did a film degree um, in London, and this was the title of my graduation film, which sort of sets up some of the themes that I have been uh, interested in, sexual and racial politics. Sexual and racial politics. Um, and when I came back, uh, I was interested to, to continue that as well. I did a writer's workshop with um, Hanif Qureshi, who at that time was coming up with new British work. I am half uh, 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 Orang Putih and, and half Orang Cina. So uh, some of this, it kind of matters. Uh, but you know, there had been a lot of Gandhi and Chariots of Fire and something like My Beautiful Lord it was a real uh, uh, um, um, something that related to me at the time. Now, uh, when I came back, the first work that I uh, w produced was uh, Happy Families, which was, whoa, okay, okay. <laughs> um, which was part of a double bill uh, uh, done uh, at the um, British Council, and this was based on, um, uh, it's, the story is, um, uh, it's a group of girls, and one of them is being sexually molested, and we have to find out who it is. Uh, I think that 
it was my first work directing, and I think, you know, some of us will have, it was a bit of a, a frightening experience. But I'm very uh, pleased that I did ask for the, uh, the actors who played the girls. They also played their fathers, they also played their mothers. So there was a lot of, um, I think, kind of interesting um, work around, uh, gen you know, this is 1993. Um, so this has kind of stayed with me. Um, and, and then Operasi Lalang happened, uh, which was not what I was expecting. Um, and I think that was a real shock for how I imagined what it would be like to come back to um, my home country and be able to uh, work um, in a way that was uh, at all connected with, you know, the notion of democracy and so forth. Um, now, Vision 2020 then came out in 1990, and it's hard to maybe remember now, but there were nine strategic objectives, and uh, this was something which took, the appeal was that it took people away from rubber and tin, sunset industries, into something called a multimedia super corridor, uh, internet, uh, uh, and uh, although it's difficult to imagine now because then what happened to what Vision 2020 was, we, we kind of know. But at the time, it was something fairly new. And to me, these were nine objectives that could be interpreted, um, and, and it was how they could be interpreted. The question around some of the work that we produced KLKO was our second uh, production. Quali Works was set up as an all women's uh, theater group. Um, and from, we produced 19, 17 productions between 94 and 2011. And this was looking at uh, the idea, it was my uh, notion of, okay, Vision 2020, it could just all end up being a lot of fluff. Uh, uh, but this story is about a young girl who wants to fight Mike Tyson. She works uh, uh, in um, Penang uh, as a factory worker. Muhammad Ali is her heroine. She remembers learning how to tie her shoelaces. Um, and this person is uh, a hero to her when she's... Um, and the opportunity comes to fight Mike Tyson uh, when he comes to KL. And it's what happens uh, uh, um, as a result. But this was part of my work, which uh, Hakka, Bahasa, English, and various kinds of accents and code switching, um, which I think is, makes, for me anyway, I worked with Tanai Ling for, um, that was the name of the character, um, um, for a number of years and, and worked with Mew because Mew was, uh, um, could speak four languages very, very uh, fluently. And this was my look at what will Vision 2020 kind of be. There was no doubt about it. We were linked to it. We said that we will, you know, hope to be able to make the objectives of one, two, three, four come about. Uh, and this is how we got funding uh, for KLKO. Um, Kathy Rowland says that there's a lingering suspicion about people who work in multiple sites. And at the time, I was um, also a newscaster at, uh, on TV2. And um, I think probably the only real, in, real news that I did read was the sacking of a certain Anwar Ibrahim um, in 1998. But uh, the important part of this was that I wanted to know what is it like to be in the belly of the beast. It seems to me that you know when you take a political stance, you need to be able to go to places that are uh, uh, difficult, at least, um, in order to be able to have a more complete understanding of some of the issues. Um, at that time, I was also associate creative director with Limcott Wing Integrated, um, who was. Apparently, uh, if I had had blue eyes or green eyes, I wouldn't have been able to read on RTM, but I had brown eyes, so I could. Um, and uh, Lim Kong Wing was at that time um, Dr. Mahathir's brown-eyed boy who did a lot of the work for Wawasan 2020. 
and also did this, which was the first voter, it was a voter education campaign to get um, um, Nelson Mandela and ANC voted. And t as far as I understand, but we don't know yet, uh, the funds did come from UMNO and Barisan National, but which is to say some gray area, surely. Uh, but this was, very, this was a very, very important um, opportunity uh, to, because, you know, one man, one vote is fine if people can read the ballot. If you have denied people education for the longest time, then how are they going to make that work? This was supposed to be a sure winner but he had to win by an overwhelming majority. And so this voter education campaign, which kind of in the end looked a bit like a kind of Benetton ad with uh, um, 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 Mandela surrounded by you know, well-cast kids of, of specific color. But this was part of a, loads of materials came from Pataling Jaya to, Ka to Cape Town and Johannesburg in the name of supporting um, uh, this venture. Um, Mandela had spoken to Mahathir in order to support, because of the support against apartheid that Malaysia had taken. If you remember, some of us, you couldn't ever travel to South, Af South Africa with a Malaysian passport. Um, okay, thanks. Then PT Foundation, or as it was, PT Pink Triangle, Sindir and Bahad, I was, um, were started off as a telephone counselor. This was something that was set up in 1987. And um, for me, this is all about uh, very much the kind of political uh, work, um, being able to provide services for LGBTQ plus people, at, all at that time it was more about homosexuals and so forth. Uh, and um, yeah, we had a rainbow nation of six different communities uh, um, at the same time that the first few rounds of anti-homosexual um, government um, ret rhetoric was happening. And the last piece of work I just want to mention that I have done is, is something which was part of uh, Marion's uh, two-minute solos. Um, it was called Missing, the launch of the Lucy A. Iskander Archives of Tolerance. And the idea was that this is, um, this is where all the missing sounds go. If you, you know, where did where is the sound of the C4 detonation at the end of edge of the forest? Well, it's in these archives. Um, and uh, I'm kind of reminded, some, I, I remember that Christians had said, the first generation to come back from overseas to use wit and humor uh, as creative therapies for their uh, uh, anxieties. I was part of that generation and um, that's the kind of work that we did at Quali Works. Um, and I don't know what happens next, but that's question two. Sorry, just take the time. Hello, hello. Thanks, thanks. And can you hear me? Hello. Okay. You kind of answered or didn't answer. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for giving us a review of the last all of your life. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I think uh, we can get to some of the uh, some of the, the details of this. Yeah, uh, maybe when we have our our uh, more mixed kind of uh, uh, dialogue, yeah, as it were. Uh, next, oh, oh you've got, you've got my, ten minutes. My, my, my turn now. Ten minutes. Uh, you gotta, you gotta press the button. Hello. Uh, press it button. Yeah. It's just like Shall in Parliament. I press it. Press it. Okay. And All I right. remind you what you've got. Ten, ten minutes left. <laughs> sure. Okay, um, uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here with me, uh, with us. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, to answer the, 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 the question, or the, I guess, go uh, straight to the point, um, why, what was it? Why is it important uh, for us, for my late partner and myself, for my late and myself, to incorporate um, the political, I suppose, uh, in, our, in our work? And I think uh, the best way to answer that question is uh, to start where it began for us. Uh, if I may, uh, if you allow me to read a poem, this one specific poem that started it all for us. Um, ah, uh, I apologize that uh, because some of the words are in, uh, uh, in Bahasa, um, and I, well, I hope you understand. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so it goes, this heart aches at your very thought. 
It grows heavier as my memories taunt me. I can hold back these tears no longer. Many years have passed, and I am now a man, yet I still yearn for you and that old house on the hill. Rindu dalam hatiku seperti ombak yang memukul pantai. Tidak akan henti sehingga akhir zaman. Sehingga daku dapat kembali ke tanah asal, jiwaku akan bergelora ingin kembali. Walaupun ketujuh lautan ku merantau, Tanjung Puteri tetap akan dikalbu. You are the eternal jewel of the South, the cradle of our civilization, the custodian of our people, the sanctuary of hope, an abode of dignity. They basked in the light of your imperial glory and trembled at the might of your warriors. Har hari berganti hari, tahun berganti tahun, namun malamku masih menjadi medan air mata. Jangan berani kau persoal cintaku, takkan dapat kau bayangkan rinduku. Anggaplah pantun ini sebagai janji. Akan datang suatu masa yang akan ku kembali menuntut hak dan menebus masa silam. Their blood courses through my veins, their prayers guide my heart. This bloodline is an oath of duty, a life of service. Sultan yang adil adalah sultan yang wajar disembah. Sultan yang zalim adalah sultan yang wajib disanggah. Now, um, this poem um, was written by my late brother, uh, Khalid uh, Muhammad Ali. He was a student of uh, politics, philosophy and economics um, at the University of Otago, New Zealand. Almost six years ago, at the age of 20, my brother Khalid decided to take his own life. He left us no letter or note, so we had no idea to the full extent of the reasons why, but he left us this poem. Um, among several others, but this very one was um, was left at the very top of the stack, and we believe it was the latest thing he wrote before before he took his life. Um, and yes, uh, if you recognize that last uh, couple of words, um, Sultan yang adil, Sultan wajar disembah, it's that is usually attributed to uh, the saying of Hang Jebat, uh, which says that you know Raja yang zalim wajib, wajib disembah, and Raja Yang, eh, sorry, wajib yang adil, wajib disembah, raja yang zalim, wajib disanggah. Meaning a good, a just ruler or leader should be followed, I suppose. Uh, whereas the, uh, the tyrant should be deposed or in this quite literally should be shunned. Um, that was something very strong uh, uh, for him. And yeah, let me just refer to this uh, at the moment, sorry. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, so that was, that, was, that was the last thing that basically he communicated to us as a family. Um, and at the time, my late father, Mom Ali Hashim, had, had a column on Sinar Haryan. And um, usually he talks about business and, you know, uh, e economics and, you know, things like that. Um, um, but because uh, his son, his youngest son, just passed away. So he decided to, you know, as in, in honor of his son, um, to publish um, that that particular poem, um, and as you can imagine, um, <laughs> those two lines, especially in the end, did not sit well with uh, some people in power. Um, and I wrote some things here as well. Um, and I, I I believe this is mainly because of two things. Uh, first of all, yes, the uh, the last two t uh, two lines, and second is the timing of the whole thing. Um, he, his death just happened to coincide with the birthday festivities of a certain uh, monarch. Um, and I think Khalid, my brother, knew exactly what he was doing. But I think that's a story for another time. So that just sort of, uh, so that poem sort of launched us into this, um, this mode of, uh, I suppose in a way, to, you know, a, a means, looking for a means to express our pain and also to express um, what we believe uh, he wanted to say and what was sort of rubbish and dismissed. Um, so essentially, this poem became fuel for us in our works, uh, which was uh, Dato Sri uh, in 2016, which was an adaptation of 
William Shakespeare's Macbeth, uh, and also uh, followed by uh, Kandang, which is an ad adaptation of uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm, uh, and that's in 2017 when it was first staged. Uh, so there's a, there's a kind of a theme there, if you, <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, but anyway, so I'll, I'll so I hope that answers the, the, the first part of the question uh, of, of why it was important for us to, to talk about that. Um, the second part was, um, what was the second part of the question again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what kinds of critical ah, questions inform your thinking? Yes. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'll, 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 I'll tell a bit of a story of, of how Dr. Sweet came, uh, came to be. Um, well, uh, to get straight to the point, as, as you know, uh, at that time, uh, you know, uh, Malaysia had our own very, our very own uh, power couple. You know, we had our own uh, uh, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, so to speak. Uh, uh, it was too obvious. It was so obvious. It was too obvious. In fact, it was too obvious that we thought, okay, you know, we're not going to push on that agenda. That is apparent enough. We'll, you know, let you know those pieces fall where it may. Okay, uh, so instead uh, we looked at other facets of uh, of, uh, of Macbeth that we could play with, um, and in fact, uh, my father uh, made a made a point, uh, a very strong decision, uh, which he convinced. I mean, to be honest, at the time or so, I thought, okay, here's an opportunity for us to bantai lah, you know, bantai these fellas, right? Because we need to talk about this, right? Uh, but my father cautioned me and said. Uh, um, Omar, he said, reminded me that the problem that we might have is not just these two people or this, you know, this party or so on and so forth. Uh, that is an, uh, perhaps an immediate uh, issue that we need to address. But uh, more importantly is that you know, we need to address the kind of uh, behavior that, uh, that has festered, uh, and he used those words, uh, festered uh, at the highest levels of society. Um, um, you know, it's not just talking about corruption, but talking about uh, the blatant uh, corruption and the rampant uh, nature of corruption, for example. And um, basically what he wanted to tackle was more of the attitudes that we have towards government, towards uh, leadership leading this country, where the vision, where we are going to go with the country. And at that point, you know, uh, we thought it was such a... Um, it was a crazy moment uh, where everything just... I feel in our history, and I think we remember this, uh, that something needed to be said and something needed to be done. And um, so the, 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 the framework uh, or the, the, the idea behind it is to talk about exactly that. Um, uh, how my father would say, budaya kemipinan, or leadership culture. Uh, and also a concept that he's always been in love with, which is amanah. Uh, which means trust, which means responsibility. And one of the things that he wanted to, to really talk about Oh, is it 10 minutes now? One minute. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, so yeah. So, what he worried, um, um, quickly, <laughs> what he really wanted to talk about was, was that, that we tend to forget that when we talk about power, sometimes we, we, we talk about perks or, you know, privileges. And we tend to forget that at the, at the core of it, you know, power is not just a position of privilege or perks. It is a position of uh, responsibility, you know. So, what do we do? when we're up there, you know? Uh, so it's not just about uh, this person, this individual, that individual, this party or that party, but once you're up there, what do we do? And he believed that, you know, perhaps, you know, in a system that, uh, that has, many, uh, has many failings, that perhaps once you're up there, perhaps you can make that change. Um, so, I'm, you know, 30 seconds, okay. Uh, so that's Dr. Um, um, uh, Sri and Macbeth, uh, but then it goes to Kandang as well, there's a lot more here, but I guess uh, we'll, I'll stop here. For now, yes. Thank you. Kita, kita sambung kejap lagi, boleh? Okay, kita sambung. So, um, thank you, thank you so much for that. I think uh, that's that's quite a, uh, a, a a good perspective on where the work the works come from, and your own uh, vantage point. Yeah, and and the, the interesting thing about the intervention from my phone was the 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 beeping sound which uh, as a parliamentarian in parliament oftentimes we have a clock and, and then it beeps and it reminds you and it you know makes you very feel very stressed out <laughs> so i think uh, you've been there you know how it is so uh, as someone who has who has uh, experienced that as well uh, maybe uh, i'll pass on yeah, to uh, hengleon okay yeah. silakan 
Thank you, Fami. Thank you, uh, Carmen. And thanks, Marion and uh, Five Hearts for inviting me here. Um, in Singapore, we call this the guillotine time. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds terrible, but uh, that was that experience. Um, I come from Singapore and uh, as a theatre practitioner, I think uh, the best way to tell what I do and how I do it is probably through talking about the work. Uh, so I'm going to talk very quickly about this particular work that I've just done, but it's a work that we've been doing for seven years. Uh, it's called Both Sides Now. It, it, it's about end-of-life issues. Uh, the reason we want to do it is really because, uh, you know, Singapore is such an urban city and everybody talk about how to regenerate, how to be alive, how to be productive. Uh, but if we look at the dignity of a person, we only look at the dignity of the person where he's alive, but we never look at the end-of-life process. So in any cities, I think, you know, if we want to look at uh, how a human being would live well, we also have to look at how they will live well. That means how they will end their life well. So that became a project and uh, our sort of our obsession for about seven years. This is our seven years. Uh, it has a number of iterations, and in each iteration, uh, we start to find different questions that we want to un answer as we're dealing with end-of-life issues in Singapore. It could be on health sector. It could be how the, the society view end-of-life issues. As we go along, I'm going to talk about this particular uh, iteration that was just done recently. We were working with uh, social agencies who are in this estate, and this is one of the poorer estates in Singapore with uh, a lot of elderly living in this particular block. And this uh, social agency has been taking care of this block and they told us that we should engage these residents because a lot of them are alone, uh, a lot of them uh, need help, and a lot of them are not thinking about end-of-life issues. And in fact, a lot of them probably would die at home alone. So I think that's really critical. So that's, for that reason, we started to engage them. Uh, we spent about three years in this place. Initially, just doing plays about end of life so that you know, they feel more comfortable with talking about it. And finally, when we started engaging this particular block, uh, we call it Block 7, uh, just, uh, we started by first going down there to talk to the residents and see whether they are interested to talk about these issues, as well as to work with our artists to create work about end of life issues. The first time when I went there, it was very, really difficult because uh, these people uh, were even struggling in their everyday lives. Uh, a lot of the elderly are really waiting for that moment to come. They don't see any hope. In fact, they just wanted to wait and let it come. So that's one thing that we noticed. And secondly, when we came to this block, we realized that it's actually a very old and a one-room flat block. block. That means it's, it's, it's really small. However, they are unique because in Singapore, most of these one-room one flats are rental units. But these are purchase units, which means that these people own the flats. But because they own the flats and they have been working their whole life trying to get this flat, right? Uh, owning this flat, uh, they... To ask them to let go of these flats when they're old would be difficult. So they become what we call as asset rich, but cash poor. And so they, they sort of uh, are not within the safety net that the government has created. In fact, they fall out of the safety nets. They will not get all the perks, all the subsidies, a lot of help that other elderly would get. So this become a community that has not been really been taken care of. So when we started to engage them, we realized that all these problems are happening. And at the same time, they are cooked inside their own house, which are really small with only one window, uh, and it's hot. And one of the things we realized that they didn't want to come to the uh, communal space, the space that we call as a void deck. That's on the first floor, a deck area, void, as in it's empty. Uh, they don't congregate there. And so, when we started to look at the space, we realized that there are a number of reasons. A, it's very dirty. Uh, two, uh, people would drink there. Uh, because the way it's being uh, designed, it's, it's right under a little slope, so it's like a little hideout. So people who drink will gather there and they drink. And sometimes they drink until late at night. 
they will fight and this. So it makes it unsafe even for elderly to be down there. And then we also realize that the community doesn't trust each other. So it's so difficult to talk about end of life. So we better talk about how to live well. So we started the whole process then, engaging them and trying to understand, do they want any change? And yes, they want. They wanted the Void Deck to be livelier. They wanted to be able to gather downstairs. So we spent a lot of time having a lot of meetings with them and trying to ask them, how do you want this space to change? Because if they cannot exist in a public space and have to keep themselves inside their own personal space, you realize that this human being, socially uh, and psychologically, would not be having a good life. I mean, we need the two sides of that, of our existence, right? So we spent about three to four months getting to know them, and then we did a number of focus groups. We create hello parties. Uh, at the same time, the artists start working with the elderly and the residents there, doing workshops, creating artwork, not about end of life, about what it means to live a dignified life at the void deck. So the void deck suddenly be doesn't become void, but it becomes uh, active. And they, the residents wanted murals, they wanted colours. So we worked with them to design them. And just as we were implementing the uh, project, we found another roadblock. But the municipal became suspicious. So the questions were, so why are you engaging the residents? Why did you pick this block particularly, not any other blocks? Why did you do focus group with them? Why did you ask them to vote? Um, of course, they also asked me, do you have political intention? <laughs> As we were negotiating with them, we were telling them actually the residents wanted all this. So then they said, you know, if we agree to one idea, we will have to entertain even more ideas. Uh, what if they talk about issues in this place through the artwork? So it is really a long process of actually negotiating them with them and trying to open up the space of what it means to create a kind of engaged society. Or through art, how do we engage people? The reason why I want to do this work is really very simple. Uh, I used to live in these kind of blocks. So I know how it feels to live you know, in a very small place. I've also realized that when I was talking to the residents, when you ask them, do you want change? Do, do you want to make some change? And they'll say that I can't. Uh, because you know, they all decide. And they become what we call as diam diam, you know, they just keep quiet, kept quiet. Which reminded me of my father. Because my father, you know, he's not very educated and when he ever he needs to go to a, a government agency and he can't speak English, before we get into the, 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 uh, the government agency, he'll be speaking in Cantonese and telling me all his complaints. He'll be very animated. But the moment he enters the agencies, he just go diam diam. And I have to speak for him. I think that's very disempowering. I think the idea of uh, making art or making theatre for me probably is really about how do we find that critical voices, voice. And we're not just, just talking about creating a, you know, you be, being able to speak. I think we all can speak. And we've been hearing a lot of noise and things on social media. Donald Trump speaks all the time, he tweets all the time. But how do we actually, uh, while we speak and while we feel that we want to be empowered, so how do we actually get critical dialogue? Yeah, one more minute, right? Uh, for me, the second thing which I thought, the last thing which I thought very important in Singapore, at least in my work, is to work in public space. Like I said, even the flats are so small, and Singapore is so small, and all land are actually almost 80 to 90% of them are controlled by the government. So the situation I had in the previous uh, narration was about if the municipal said no, I can't create the work there. In fact, the elderly who have spent so much time working and creating the work would not be able to see an audience. So in a space where, in a place 
where space is so limited and where it is so controlled, the best way to deal with it is to deal with it out there in the open and to be at the public space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but before I get Carmen to interrogate us, <laughs> like, uh, I, I totally know exactly what you're... Like, the thing that crossed my mind is now, like, who is the MP here? <laughs> I said, who is the MP in that, in that kawasan? Uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, in fact, just before coming here, I was in one void deck myself. So in, in one of our public housing projects, so I know exactly uh, what you're talking about and the kind of difficulties there. I would ask, like, who is this person who's doing work here? Is he trying to unseat me? <laughs> so, come in. Okay, well, thank you for all your comments. I mean, I think it's kind of interesting you're looking at it more from a space, space perspective. So looking at it as, as a physical location where politics and arts can go inside. And for Omar, it's more of a much more deeply personal uh, story which also overlaps with things that are happening at the time. And similar with Anne, I think both of you are quite similar in the sense that you have personal intersecting with the political, right? I mean, in terms of what's happening in the country. I guess uh, the way for me to think about all this would be, do you find it useful to think of art as uh, arts, meaning your performance or your work, as a vehicle to propagate or express these ideas? Do you find it as an outlet for you or is it something else? Is it more of a vo vocation or something that you feel needs to go out there as a message? I mean, does it function more as a personal kind of tool or would you see it as much more of a social or political tool? If I mean, you can answer too because you've been doing some performing <laughs> as well. Uh, I, in, in my most recent work uh, called GE14, I have this line <laughs> where, where I say all art is political, but not all that is political has art. So to me, uh, I, get, I, I became involved in the arts because of politics, and I am now in politics because of the arts. Uh, to me, I got involved in, in the arts, uh, because 1998 happened, reformacy happened, I felt that there was so much happening and I wanted to express myself in a safe way without getting beaten up or tear gas or arrested. So I took it to the stage. And then I realized a lot of my friends gave up hope on, on Malaysia. And then I decided that uh, at one point I would have to stop making art and actually intervene. Otherwise, all of my audience would disappear. So, I, in order to save my audience, I had to save Malaysia. So, <laughs> so I got into politics. So, for me, it's, 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 the personal is very political. such a, I think it's probably second wave of Western feminism as a, as a um, term and I think it's kind of been, you know, the longevity or validity of a phrase is how often you can kind of mess about with it uh, and explore and, and, and see what kind of meanings it actually has. I think definitely for me it is very personal. Um, uh, I write, I started writing because um, I kind of enjoy doing it, you know, uh, as, a, as a young, um, I wasn't so good at maths, you know, that kind of a, 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 a simplicity. But I think eventually you do look, I mean, I'm sorry for not answering the question directly, but I answered one of the questions which were part of the, thank you, part of the, um, uh, scaffolding behind the main question so that there's at least kind of because I'm not sure that you know you should never presume anybody knows what it is that you've done uh, uh, but uh, and I think that yeah for sure in theatre it's the space alternative space for you know you, you can't find the stories that you want to hear or that you're familiar with so you start to write them you start to look to be able to 
um, engage with others. Um, and I think uh, it is a manifest, a very small space or a very large space, but you are looking to be able to connect with other people. Um, well, um, my thoughts on it is, uh, I'm like, for example, like uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, about my father wanted to talk about uh, the idea of Amana and uh, leadership culture, would I have been and all that. Um, those things are actually things that he's actually he spent his whole life talking, you know, uh, here and there, uh, uh, panels here and there, talking about, you know, how to change, you know, to have this paradigm shift in our society. Uh, because part of, you know, a bit of context, part of, it, part of his job is to, to improve the economic situation of, uh, uh, among the Malays, for example, you know, and, um, and he realized that, that, that you know, an important journey that, that, that we have to take is to, to, to have new eyes and you know, to, to, to look and understand the world in a different way and to, to, to sort of adapt ourselves in, in our current situation. Um, so he spent a lot of time talking about, about, um, about that paradigm shift. Um, and, uh, and, and he spent half his life doing that. And then he realized at some point, or rather, you know, we would argue about this, and I would say, that sometimes, you know what, you know, where does this go? You know, is it is it really going to change anything? You know, are, are people really, you know, they, are, are, are people ready for this change? Do, do they want this change, or are they going to just fall back to to their privileges or their, you know, um, and so on and so forth? So um, I remember what my father uh, said. Uh, in fact, towards the end of his life, uh, you know, just weeks before he passed away, in fact, um, he said that you know, Omar, perhaps you know, because he, he, he's one to, to to have always sort of worked within the system. Try to you know try to slowly change, and he says that true change is always something that, that happens slowly over generations. It's not it's not something a lot of the, a lot of times you want change instantly, right? And sometimes we should just totally forget about that. Uh, but he insists on on a slow, methodical shift in, in our behavior, in our attitudes towards things. And uh, towards the end of his life, he, he realized that you know well, perhaps he said perhaps arts is the best way to communicate this, to discuss this. Perhaps this is the, the, the um, um, because he's always been talking in like you know business conference in the context of that you know so a lot of times we're like oh, what are all of these values are we talking about but the arts is I you know he believes and I and I believe this too is the perfect platform if you want to want to talk about values on our vision where we want to go as a society and I don't know how you feel about this but I, I've always had this sense that Malaysia is very top heavy. Uh, in the sense that, you know, um, you are, we are told what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, how to live our lives. Uh, and it's very top-heavy. It's, you know, we've got authorities that tell that, uh, that's going to be religious authorities or whatever, you know, in, on a societal level. Uh, whereas the arts, I feel, you know, I mean, by its nature, it's, uh, I feel it's very, you know, it's very grassroots, it's very, you know, bottom-up, you know, bottom-up. <laughs> I mean, it's ground-up, it's, it's ground-up, so we, we work the other way around. And, and I think, you know, with my father's thoughts on it as well, I feel that uh, perhaps it's time we, we recognize that, that, you know, it's, it takes two to tango. You know, yes, we still have the, you know, you know the uh, web top, the bottom kind of uh, you know, laws and policy and all that, politics, but arts come in and so that we have this discussion, you know, what kind of society do we want, what kind of vision do we want uh, uh, for the future of Malaysia, for example. Thank you. So we were talking about Singapore. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure, you know, politics is a problem. But I think power is the problem. The way power is being, you know, used and manifested and how we view power, the privilege that comes with it. Uh, so, so I think what is scary about power is what it does to people. And I think, you know, in Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Press, talks so much about how it alienates, how it divides and rule, how it, in the end, you know, make you, make you feel that, you know, you're not capable enough, you can't change, but you must be, you must rely on the existing power. So, that's where I think, uh, where art does this. Through the act of play, through the act of improvising, through the act of creating, you are telling your own stories, you're finding your own voice, you're finding your own power in the way. I think that's what it does so that it can counteract, you know, that, that 
how politicians or how those people in power tries to control and tell you this is the only way things must run and can run. And, and that kind of uh, pay that, you, I know that the way you say, you know, I think uh, uh, that, that create change is, is important because uh, uh, it gives hope, but at the same time, I, I want to also talk about that critical change that you're talking about. I mean, change is easy, but what is critical change? Then uh, how do you make sure that when we make changes, it's not just about you getting power, but how do we actually we look at, in particular my work, I talk a lot about relations, our relations with each other, our relations with the environment, and I think very importantly, how do we hold mirror to ourselves so that we look at our relations with ourselves? Our own. I think the critical part is a lot, not just about being critical of the others, but how to be critical to of yourself so that you know how you exist. I think that's where art, a lot of time, we're looking at ourselves and making the work. Uh, in a way, yes, that all, all arts are political because also talks about ourselves relating to other people. And I think uh, uh, I, I, I also think that maybe that's why sometimes the, the politicians are afraid of artists or they feel they don't know how to deal with artists. Yeah. Before that, I think uh, I'm the most terrifying one because I am an artist politician. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, before, and the, the, the word that, that came to my mind as, as you were saying this now, uh, as you were talking, the, the, the word is uh, agency. Uh, I think possessing agency, we can be enfranchised but we have no agency. Uh, and, and power of being now part of the system, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how this empowering it can be, being in the system. When you know uh, just because you have so-called power, but uh, you know, in, in Malaysia, I, what I like, how I like to describe it is we've changed the top. It's really this middle that is very resistant. So uh, you can change from the top, you can change from the bottom, but if the middle doesn't give, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I just would like to uh, take the opportunity to ask the two former member of parliament and current member of parliament. I mean, this this is not just play play, right? This is you have been voted in into uh, you were voted into position of. You were appointed. Okay, okay, uh, but you were elected. Okay, can you can you say a little bit about what it is to appointed or elected <laughs> to feel, you know, absolutely in a position of power? I mean, just in terms of a story to tell us, kind of. Take us into that place. Before you start, Nira, don't mind, because most of us are not Singaporeans here. So just to give a little bit of structural background, how is it this arts-nominated member of parliament can come to be? Is it like a very wonderful innovation in Singapore politics, or is this a <laughs> 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 this person and then it goes to a select committee in the parliament select committee selects well then the president must agree and then you get appointed but the arts nominated member of parliament is slightly different so after many years of getting weird nominated MPs on arts who we don't even know what they do so arts engage which is an online kind of a group of uh, artists uh, sort of gather together and say, why don't we nominate our own and do voting? So we gather together, uh, PT is one of them, they found. <laughs> so we, we all came together and then there was a, a process of people putting up their names, arts maker or people in the art sector to put up their name, and then the arts community will speak to this person in a particular 
uh, during a town hall and then decide whether they want to support this person, sign and put up a long list of names and submit it to the select committee. So it makes it difficult sometimes for the government, especially if this person has a constituent. But by right, this person does not have a constituent. There lies that you know, weird relationship. I, I, I resonate with uh, uh, Fami just now when, when it says that you no. Know, uh, of course, you know, I don't think you know, that two years allow me to really understand what those people at the top are really thinking. But you do find a lot of resistance at different levels. And, and that's where I feel most happy when I step down. <laughs> uh, really because I find I have more latitude and more space to play with other things. I think when you're within a system, uh, there are a lot of bureaucracy, there are a lot of things actually blocking. And you find that you are spending time clearing the hurdle. You're not even doing the work, you know. You're, sometimes you can't even clear a hurdle, you're finding time trying to go around it. And, and of course it's a complex system. It's really a complex system, you know, where everybody has it's hegemonic in, in many ways. You know, everybody has something that they want to take, protect. It has to do with their career, it has to do with what they believe in. And so you realize that you're engaging with so many people that in the end you, you're, you, you, you're like moving a little pebble and you do not know whether how much it actually goes down to the ground. Or probably only serves a particular group of people. So then I then decided, of not that I, not that I decided, but I really feel happier now I'm doing my work. Yeah. That's what I was To me, to me, uh, uh, Parliament is a performance site. <laughs> so so I, I look forward to performing. <laughs> but yes, uh, I think I think uh, uh, this this the, the way that that uh, power is embodied in the system and how the system perpetuates itself across time demands a certain engagement process or, or a, a way of interacting. If you don't subscribe, if you don't use the same language, if you don't use the same vocabulary, if you don't, then you better diam diam. You know this kind of this kind of thing. It's not just in Singapore; it's in many places. Yeah. And actually, the most interesting sites of performance for me uh, actually is in these these uh, uh, the, the kind of like really off not not off the beaten track, but in the problem with democracy today and the role that arts and performance can play is in deliberative democracy or participatory democracy uh, where when we look at what's happening across western europe across the atlantic and, and how for many people they feel that uh, democracy is no longer serving uh, so-called will of the people but which people who who is being represented so the question that was why in, in when i was working on ge14 the work not the they both are works, but the performance that I presented with Zanya Mashita, the question, the initial question that we had was the nexus or the interconnectivity between uh, the personal, the political, and the poetic. So, the poetic in the sense of uh, the vocabulary, the, the vernacular, the, the, the way that you are, are trying to, you know, uh, try to communicate this. Um, and, and so I think, to me, actually, uh, what is most interesting in, in a lot of the words that, that we're discussing right now is asking this question about, to some extent, agency. Do we have, we, we can vote, but then for many of us, democracy ends once you cast your vote. Whereas actually democracy is more demanding than that. And I mean, this is something which I've come to see for myself now. But maybe we can go to the second round of questions. Okay, good timing for me. I was just thinking about that. Uh, it, maybe to move to the second question, it's more to do with the future. And I think it's kind of interesting to compare Singapore and Malaysia here since we're looking at the, in terms of how parliament 
constructs the role of the artist. I mean, clearly, because Singapore is like a very strong creative industries hub, it sees creative industries as a tool for, make, for economy, for economic purpose. So it makes sense that they would want to have the say or have voice from the arts community since that arts community feeds into a kind of creative economy. Whereas Malaysia, somehow we are either not there or we think the economy doesn't matter or we think uh, the arts community won't generate that kind of creative uh, economy the way that Singapore has. So the second question actually leads to that in the sense that all over the world now people are moving more into thinking of creative fields as a place where the economy can be generated. Right? So in, in, in that sense, I'm just curious what you all think for the panelists. Do you think there is a way for practitioners, both political practitioners, aka politicians, elected or appointed, uh, and also artists, they have a way to meaningfully and productively engage moving forward? Could it be that now we are moving into an era where politicians do see more worth coming from the arts community uh, and therefore there is more ways in which they would want to productively engage whether it's for the economy, whether it's for communicating certain values or pushing the nation forward in terms of a different way of thinking or whether as Omar says, you know, slowly building the values. Do you see politicians and artists having some kind of uh, way to meaningfully engage to this end? Anybody can start first, yeah. Fabi, can you do the time? I am okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of this, uh, can I just jump straight um, to this point? And I feel that uh, perhaps uh, my fellow arts practitioners uh, might agree with this. Um, uh, there is a frustration that I feel uh, among us that I feel that, that the arts, especially in this country, feels, and I, know you, I think you alluded to that as well, uh, almost. Uh, Unappreciated, uh, not just as a. I mean, sometimes we talk about the, you know, the theatre industry or the arts industry. I mean, is it really an industry? I, I won't even question that. You know, I mean, how industrious are we in, in, in looking at this? Um, like, um, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a deep uh, frustration. Uh, in fact, actually, because if you look at, uh, I just see this here. If you look at like, a lot of societies, a lot of developed societies uh, all over the world, and um, and that's the thing. I, I found it interesting that, that it's it's. That we begin this conversation almost like uh, you know the creative industry is almost something new that we can you know that we tap into. But to go further back in history, uh, if you look at any any um, uh, human societies and in developed nations, the appreciation for the arts or culture, especially going back to that word culture, uh, because that's essentially where I feel uh, the political and and the artistic. Uh, uh, connect culture because that's what we're doing. We're creating culture uh, and setting what uh, where we want to go as a society. Um, a lot of developed nations have this very distinct, uh, distinct appreciation for the arts. And we talk, um, when we talk about the arts, we talk about um, humanities, uh, we talk about uh, universities, we talk about uh, libraries, we talk about museums. And these are the things, and when I say about arts, you know, the, the, you know that aspect of this country, it's almost like, you know, you look at our national museum, for example. You know, I, I, I don't mean to criticize, uh, but it's just something that we, you know, we we are lucky. It's almost like we don't appreciate, you know, uh, our roots. Even you know, it's almost like we don't even appreciate our history. If even you know, a lot of us can argue that parts of our history are not even true. It's just something concocted to you know for for some um, you know for some you know for very specific political purposes, for example. And how do we move forward as a society if we don't understand you know our true past, for example? They don't understand our present. You know, so how do we move forward? What kind of vision do we have? And I feel like it's kind of sad. You know, we mentioned you know Vision 2020 one point. It's almost like you know, it's almost like that's is that all we have? You know, and even that that we had, we sort of failed it, and we we failed it. You know, all of us together. You know, so I feel like like um, um, in, in in terms of hoping for the future, is I, I feel like, and then, like you said as well, you know, um, it's the middle. You know, whether the bottom, you know. Top and bottom, you know, where we go with it, but it, but you're right. You know, I mean, we, we have we suffer this problem in any company as well. Middle management is always such a problem, right? You know, <laughs> sometimes it makes that disconnect. And I think on a societal level, that's exactly um, the kind of problem that we have as well. And I think 
if we, you know, if Malaysia as a whole, you know, not just not just the government, uh, not just the the, the, the the highest level of government, uh, the top people up there, or just the people, the grassroots. I think as a whole, if we don't learn to appreciate the importance of arts, of more importantly culture, uh, on how we want to live, you know, uh, how are we living right now? Where do we come from? Or where do we want? To, where do we want to go? These are the questions that I feel that is very important uh, for us to discuss, and I, I believe this is part of that discussion itself. Um, now where am I going with this? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I wanted to accept that, that sort of uh, uh, hoping, yeah, hoping that we would realize this. The sooner, the better. And I think, uh, if I may say, like, you know, the recently, uh, oh, you know, they say, oh, Malay youth, forget about the arts. You know, don't be lazy, go into such uh, Who said that recently? And that was a deep frustration for me because knowing that, oh, we're going back to that. How baru is Malaysia baru then? You know, what What are we looking forward to? I mean, where are we going, you know? We, and I don't think this, you know, I don't think it's, it's we can just sit back and, oh, it's okay, our leaders will tell us uh, where to go. It's, it's not that time anymore. And I feel that we must grab this, you know, while it's here and to, to, to really find a vision for ourselves. What kind of Malaysia are we looking at? What kind of society do we, do we want to live in? What kind of values are right and wrong? And I think arts, in that case, can you know, you know, can promote participation, more participation in a, in, a, in this dialogue to to the country, to to the, the politics, I suppose. Thank you. I hope that makes some sort of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's, um... Vision twenty thirty. I think that that's already been floated yeah. around. So if you have more time, I can <laughs> think about it. Uh, okay. For me, the idea of, I mean, creative industries actually is already being a bit rubbish, I think, because, you know, what happens is that communities are gentrified and, and in the end, you know, who benefits from it? Uh, it's, it's kind of depending on class and so forth. But I think, I think the other thing is that in relation to um, where do we go forward from here, I think various initiatives uh, have always been around. Um, and I don't, I think, there is such a thing as an idea whose time has come in the sense that, I mean, 20 years ago there was a um, there was the Football Association of Malaysia, which was actually Farida, um, Farida American, myself, and Marion, and we came up with something called the Majlis Sanid Nagara. It was supposed to be something that would be along the lines of um, a body like so many other bodies, which have funding, which have, um, uh, you know, control over the main artistic institutions, arts education, and, and so forth. And I think that uh, there are always uh, various initiatives, and it's just kind of how are they going to be taken up? Uh, uh, I think that you, you just have to keep uh, trying. There's now this, uh, there's a group called um, Reformatsi, for uh, uh, instance, which is looking at engaging over a period of time uh, arts in, in, in relation to changing policy for arts education, arts funding, and around the area of freedom of expression. Um, <laughs> too far, I think. Um, so I think, and you know, we, we have uh, various issues of, you know, I think it's been written so many times, you know, we have various streams. We have streams according to language, and it's who's able to uh, uh, cross over into the various streams and unite people and unite ideas. And, and we always, that's where uh, uh, we, to a certain extent, you know, everybody has been kind of uh, uh, producing work anyway, irrespective of this idea of necessarily all coming together. And I think there are times, it's not true that, people have never come together, you know, at various times they have, you know. Um, of course, it takes something like um, May 1969 for issues of which, you know, we all know in relation to um, Christian and what, what, his, what his work and what, how he identified that as being a particular period from before the riots and after the riots. I think um, those, the ways in which we come together about arts, so I think are those small incremental things. There, there isn't this idea that top-down is going to happen. It's got to be from various initiatives and then 
uh, at some point they will come together. Um, but uh, it certainly helps to have a minister of culture arts or whichever it is who actually knows about um, what they mean. Uh, it, it, um, if it's just about tourism, then that's a particular use of the arts, but it's not going to be uh, very supportive of uh, ground up kinds of initiatives. So, I mean, that kind of thing helps. In terms of political structures uh, and in terms of audiences being able to be more uh, educated, uh, to, you know, I'm often. We did some work with the Malaysian Association for the Blind, and uh, it was a learning curve for us to understand how uh, people of low vision are also blind, how would they want to come to uh, watch theatre? And uh, I made the beautiful decision to, um, in the first meeting, ask, is there a projector because I'd like to show some slides. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I, think, I think there are lots of things that we kind of assume and, and we don't know anything about, so we need to kind of never mind necessarily about moving forward, we just sort of stop, look around where we are and just within sort of, you know, um, well there's all sorts of, but the spheres of influence I think you, 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 um, you work within the area where you are and you hope to be able to engage uh, um, with others. Uh, and I think not everybody's up for political activism, you know. Uh, it's just the way it is. Um, I, I think quite a lot of governments now in different parts of the world are uh, not really talking about creative industry, but in fact they have been instrumentalizing, instrumentalizing art a lot of time for the purpose of whatever agenda they have. Uh, Singapore, about five or six years ago, had this uh, ACSR. Uh, which is their new cultural policy. The intention was actually to bring arts to community and galvanize the community together. So, I think this Chinese writer, Lu Xun, uh, Lu Xun talk about uh, the difference between uh, uh, artists and uh, politicians. And, and, and he says that uh, politicians does all this in order to unite unite people under the politicians, you know, power and, and, and the way they can uh, govern, govern. Whereas artists, their intention was not about uniting, but to allow for diversity, to allow for dissensus and consensus. And so my response to this is that, Yes, actually, in fact, uh, in Singapore, I do see the government a lot of time reaching out to artists and say, hey, let's come do something together. But when it comes to some point, you know that the agenda is very different. Because for them, it's to create a nice utopia, uh, a vision of utopia that we all live together and we are happy. Uh, and we should uh, uh, just forget about the differences and just work towards that. And there's some trade-off, let's work with this trade-off. Uh, some people may be marginalized in this process. It's okay, let them be marginalized as long as everyone is okay. Uh, so that idea suddenly uh, uh, has been like, no, the thing that we have been pushing. But however, as artists, you know, I think a lot of time, I, I personally think this is my agenda, huh? I have to say this, that I believe that it's not just about the voice of that majority, but the voice of the minority. I. I, I feel that then the artist's work in, in this thing is if you want to work with us or if I want to work with you, then I must make sure that the voice uh, would be as diverse as possible. That I'm not looking at conversation that somehow we just simply go with agree to disagree. I, I really hate that phrase because my government has been appropriating that all the time, saying that all the time, because it's frustrating just to agree and to disagree. Uh, because you just say, hey, yeah, okay, I disagree. Then what? Uh, I, I, I personally hope that we can come to a point where by, because I, I also believe a lot in, in participator, participation, but the participation at a level whereby it's not just about I go to the wall and I paint something there. I think what I paint must be listened to. And 
and, and, and in my work, I, I talk a lot about what I call as vulnerable listening, vulnerable observing. Because uh, only when you recognize your own vulnerability, that when you hear the vulnerability of another person, that you're able to work with that person at that level. That for me is deep empathy. And only when you can recognize your own vulnerability and work with it, you build resilience. And so the artist, I feel a lot of time maybe I was trying to understand what I'm trying to do also. That maybe my work is trying to deal with how to deal with change and how do we build that capacity to deal with change within everyone. Because that's the most scariest thing, right? Because change happens all the time. And, and sometimes what power does is to tell you, no, when change comes, things get bad. And you then get paralyzed. You can't move. But no, change does mean that you know, you're, not, you're not comfortable. But it doesn't mean that you have to be paralyzed by it. That you, you, it, it sometimes you may fall back because you are dealing with the change. But that is part of the process. Just talking about change, I'm trying to remember, Christian uh, said once that, uh, w again, cast your mind back, um, for those of you who are not born, then, ah, difficult. But uh, there was this idea that the, um, he mentioned around, okay, for if Anwar comes into power, there will be a shift in cultural and arts policy. Uh, and it's what, whatever the ch change will be, it will be around Islamist, Islamic uh, notions around what culture and arts are. And that will be a huge shift f uh, um, post-69. That will be the next major change. Um, and I, I think that uh, that actually represents um, quite a l significant challenge for um, Malaysians, in general, uh, because we are being divided increasingly more by religion and by notions of, um, you know, interpretations of um, of the Quran. So, in in relation to arts and culture, I think it seems to be already a very clear battleground for how um, music, uh, how you know, these things are to be controlled, and also in particular, you know, um, bodies female bodies in particular need to be controlled around uh, uh, um, arts and culture. And I don't think while, you know, we have this kind of happy Pakatan happening uh, in terms of the government at least having three or four more years, uh, in the offing to me is a very, very serious kind of energetic and um, creative and driven um, body of ideas around what is going to be good for the country uh, in terms of arts and culture. And that ne hasn't necessarily been articulated in a very um, um, detailed way, but I think that uh, some of this is political. What does that mean? Well, it means around, of course, you know, nations, uh, notions of being able to control power and what, what, what is to be done. I think that at the moment, kind of exactly because we have a minister who doesn't really know about it's kind of like it's still the area which is kind of we don't want to deal with, we don't know how to deal with it, and uh, I do think that when it comes, we need to have somebody who would be uh, knowledgeable about uh, um, arts and culture, and it may not be the person that we expect, but it'll be change. Uh, 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 and, uh, and then we will, ah, finally we have something to gather around uh, as to um, whether to support it and in what ways to support it. Yeah, just, just to connect the threads of what Hamlet says and what you're saying as well. And to me, it's interesting that what you said, Hamlet, is that basically people, it's hard to have change. And it's hard to think about change, but change is not necessarily a bad thing. But if you look back at our nation's history, we haven't changed for 61 years, then suddenly we change. I mean, there are other changes, you know, micro levels happening, but in terms of the big change. So there's a huge shift, that's one. But it's a shift that is, because it seems like no shift has happened for 61 years when it actually happened, people don't know what to do with it. People have like great resistance to it. They embrace certain things, but they also want certain things to remain the same, aka stable, aka we feel good because things are not so rocky or chaotic. 
So in a weird way, I see like arts is playing a different kind of role where we want art to remain the safe space. We don't want funny like LGBT icons in our exhibitions because you know that's weird and that's not something we want to encourage because we have so much change. Let's have some things that are still again normal status quo and haven't changed. But we 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 can't be there because a lot of things are not status quo. So in a strange way, arts to do the kinds of work that you're both saying that arts has to push for certain changes. It's hard to do in a context where everything seems like changing at the same time. Right? I mean, if you think about it, it's easier for artists to push against something if it's a status quo. But what if the status quo is no longer there? Then what should artists be critical about? What, what is the new you know, thing that we would question or critique? Because right now we are asked or we are expected not to be too critical because we are in a so-called Malaysia Baru, new nation, everything is new. But then at what point do we criticize and how can that criticism be productive? And just now you talk about you know, being critical, so I'm curious what, how would you see the difference between change and critical change to, to use your words? Mm, it, it reminded me of uh, what happened in Taiwan in the 80s. Uh, at one point, the uh, small theater in the Taiwan movement was political, social, they really dealt with all the change. And then when, when there was this uh, whole political shift, right, uh, it created a void within the uh, arts uh, uh, practitioner community. What happened was that after that, the entire theatre movement became an exploration of form and aesthetics. And so they do a lot of experimentation because there's nothing for them to bounce off. Uh, that can be quite scary. Uh, so up to some point, then people start to ask, what's the point of making art? Then in the way, then the, the rhetoric answer will be, oh, try to reach out to as many people as possible. Uh, then commercialization, uh, industrialization of art all started coming in. So, so I think that that was something that was quite indicate, uh, quite interesting to, to sort of reflect about. Uh, I think uh, one of my favorite writers, with whom I always quote, uh, Mu Xin, he always says, "No, pessimism is foresight." Uh, meaning that you know, even in view, in view of change, do not just always see all change to be positive. I mean, to be dialectical, then you have to be critical. You have to look at all sides of it. And then probably our work, I mean, my work then would be to deal with, so in that particular change, what will happen? What are the side effects? I mean, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, Boao's uh, foreign theatre, it's really not, foreign theatre is really not about finding the solution. What foreign theatre was really about, how to work together, to how to be critical of all these suggestions that comes out, and work through what works for you and what doesn't work for others and how you manage it. So that critical pedagogy is very much part of Boal's uh, idea. And, and, and extending on that, what happened here is that Boal's uh, foreign theatre creates, just now we were talking about this thing called parallel universe. You have a play that has this universe and then you decide to intervene and create another universe of another possibility. What you did is two things. You create an alternate space, you can create an alternative time, a different time space. And in fact, in crisis moment, most of our lives are is that, you know, we, we, we only have that short moment to make decision. But in theatre or in art, we extended the time. We allow ourselves to learn, to be critical, to reflect, to enjoy the play. So I think the, the, the role of the art is to constantly create that kind of uh, alternate space, that parallel universe, for us at least breathe in light of all these changes. I, I, I feel the same way. Uh, actually, uh, the, the one thing that I'm actively doing right now in, in Parliament actually is to say how arts needs to come into Parliament. So I mentioned uh, how, for example, Parliament this year is uh, 60. Oh, wait, wait. 
60. Yeah, I mean, I, we reach a milestone, for Malaysian Parliament, it's like 60 years. And uh, we don't even know, for example, who the, the, the portrait painters of the Agongs and the speakers and the presidents of the yeah, Ha? Huh? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. What I mean is, they, they need to put more information. Uh, so, when when in Parliament, I've said we should actually put the plans and put and give more information about that. But it's not just about that. Uh, like for example, we need to bring. Uh, I, I mentioned to uh, Balai Balai Sini, for example, uh, we should bring more more works into Parliament so that. MPs can see these are the this is part of the permanent, permanent collection of uh, Balai Seni Negara. Uh, but what's interesting for me is that uh, the arts can create uh, space and time for us to consider, for us to to mull, to dream, and, and after that, if you want to take action, then you can. So I think I think that much of it is is uh, uh, for me is, is quite interesting. I mean, I mean um, to further that, that notion, and I feel like the, the I mean, I mean in theatre, I mean, I'm sure you're very aware of this because that's exactly what we do. It's almost like we put a you know we put a slice of life or a scenario or anything. We we pose a question on stage, right, and then we pull back and we have a look at it. You know, and as audience members, we get to like see. So how do we feel about this? You know, and any issue I think uh, can be. I feel. That's why, I, I, again, it's a, you know, the arts is, you know, the, you know, one of the best platforms to, to have this discussion, to, to question these things, to, to, because we get the opportunity to put it uh, on stage and, like you said, alternate universe, and see and, and play where it might go, perhaps, and then we can look back and go, how do we feel about this? Is this right? Is this wrong? And at the very least, as you said, you know, it's a space for us to just take a breather and say, okay, this is... This is the experience that we go through. Can I just say something about political and theatre together? I think um, for many people, the two words mean something like a lecture, something like didactic, something like agitprop, something which is, you know, uh, um, not exactly entertaining. There is this idea, I think, around um, the, the political that it should be uh, very hard hitting, and um, often uh, it is. Uh, humorless, which I think is um, one of the strategies uh, that political theater kind of <laughs> um, made as a stereotype uh, uh, is associated with. Um, I think that to, to, to look at something like a form of political satire, I think is an area where um, I think, you know, issues, um, um, differences of opinion, this is a space that, or this is a form, or this is a mode, I mean, lots of debate around what uh, satire would be, but this is a mode where it is possible to um, look at being able to engage with a very large number of, uh, um, 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 number of people and various groups of the population. Uh, and I think that uh, although satire, kind of when it's funny, and there's all sorts of you know, ideas around what is funny is that, you know, there's something called gelotophobia, which is fear of being laughed at. Um, and so certain satire is not going to be funny for those who suffer from various conditions of gelotophobia. Um, but otherwise, uh, you, you, you've also got something called, you know, invective, which is, which is again satire, but very, very hard hitting. Uh, I think that sometimes, maybe, uh, uh, there is this idea that, you know, political always, you know, it can't be funny, it can't be uh, uh, something light, because then, then it's not serious enough. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, that's not necessarily the only strategy uh, or, or um, that, that many people, you know, it's available to take up in terms of creating connections. May, may I jump to that? I, I, yes, I share this from a very strong way, in fact. Uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, uh, through our experiences doing Dato Sri and Kanan, both, you know, I'll, you know, talk about, you know, certain heavy topics, about these concepts, you know, politics uh, here and there. Uh, but I agree with you very strongly, in fact, um, because Dato Sri, because of the drama, because right, it's a tragedy, right? Because, you know, sometimes a lot of the, a lot of the references, 
political references, for example, that we need to set, you know, uh, uh, societal references, uh, would totally miss, uh, I think, you know, being part of the audience watching it as well. But um, comedy was, you know, with Kandang, <laughs> was a different animal. <laughs> no pun intended, yeah. Uh, because it was basically humor that carried uh, these, these conversations, these questions. And I found it precisely that. Humor, you know, people responded to it. it we, we could even laugh at ourselves, you know. Um, I mean, yes, there were a lot of sore, uh, you know, bums uh, as well. But, uh, but these are the, the things that you can play with. I mean, even, even the whole concept, even, you know, because, you know, you mentioned religion. Um, the whole idea, what I found interesting was the whole, the whole, even the whole idea of a Malay actor uh, playing a pig. Um, saying shukur, you know, to some of the audience, that was the most offensive thing in the show. And at the same time, I feel like you know, we should take time to reflect that, hey, do you not see what's going on and what they are systematically doing to the people within this play? That doesn't offend you, but what offends you is the fact that as a Malay actor, you know, playing a pig, saying shukur. So, you know, in, in that sense, you know, I, I, at the same time, we can laugh about it. You know, and I, I, I strongly uh, agree with you with this one from, from experience how, how you know, like Kandang, for example, for, for us, felt like a more effective uh, vehicle uh, in, in discussing uh, and talking or, or even posing these questions as opposed to Dato Sri, which got lost in drama. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, on the subject of uh, humor, of course, we have our cartoonist, Zuna, mm -hmm. who basically used humor throughout his very long career to criticize the government to great effect. I mean, I think Najib is more afraid of Zuna than, than almost any other politician for a time. Uh, so do you, do you see that, is it possible to think of humor as a way to bridge the seriousness of politics with the arts? I mean, I know Shah started the intro by saying we have to have a serious dialogue, but is it possible to have a serious dialogue about Funny things, you know. Um, I I think uh, uh, humor does definitely help uh, because um, uh, I mean, again uh, in reference to this because you know these things are you know these are serious subjects uh, and it, it's it's very serious. so when you try to insert in drama for example it becomes very people stop listening basically that's what I'm saying it's like oh it's just so heavy and it's like oh okay you know and then. Uh, the, all the references and whatever, but when you make light of it, I feel it really gives this. Uh, and also, well, I mean, you mentioned uh, quite rightly so, like you know, when we laugh, you know, uh, do we laugh at ourselves or do we laugh at other people? And then, you know, who? Um, but I think I think a certain approach, and I think it's a conscious approach that we took with uh, with Kanda, for example, is that that it's not so much that we are laughing at them, but it's an approach of you know, this is us, yeah. and we're laughing, laughing at ourselves. So we're giving the space for everyone who's watching it. I mean, of course, people, some people will get fun of it anyway. Uh, but at least give the chance for people to realize that, hey, these are our eccentricities and idiosyncrasies, and we need to see that, oh, we are being silly. You know, and, and Kandang was great was because it's a, well, this is, look at this bunch of animals trying to create a country. So it's saying that, look at us, you know, you know we bunch of, you know, okay, we're going to create a country, we're going to put laws and whatever. Uh, so, you know, let, let, let's look at our mistakes and laugh at it, uh, learn from it. And I, I feel, back to, to, to what you were saying, that with humor, it, it just lightens a conversation that we need to have anyway. Whereas drama, for example, you know, like a tragedy, like a pet, it was, it's, the subject can be already be awkward thing for a lot of people. Uh, so humor just sweetens it, like, oh, okay, yeah, let's laugh about it, yeah. And I think uh, from experience doing that, with both Latusri and Kandang back to back, that was uh, uh, a very distinct. Uh, I, I felt like uh, what, what we wanted to say, the concept of Amana and whatever, was more effectively said and expressed through uh, the humor of Kandang as opposed to the drama of uh, Latusri. Okay, we, we, yes, we are almost out of time, but uh, are there any last things you want to say before we open up to the floor? I want to hear from the floor. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so maybe we'll, we'll start early to take questions. There's a mic going around and I think one of our mics will be used as well. Uh, can I just ask the audience, when you speak, you, we need to mic you or put a mic on you because we are recording this. 
Uh, so you would not be heard if you didn't have a microphone. So can yeah. Yeah. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and someone will come with a mic. Uh, there's funky tape there on the, on, on the side. We'll take questions as they come. If there's too many questions, then I might take a few at a time. So since nobody has raised their hand, I'll just ask Pan to start to get the ball rolling. Okay. Uh, hi, Pan. Uh, so I'm actually very uh, fascinated by some of the contrasting, uh, or actually uh, almost symbiotic uh, uh, propositions being, being made on the panel. So on one hand, uh, I, I'm very uh, fascinated by Hingren's uh, remark about how the arts can be appropriated by political structures to become mouthpieces, to become propaganda. And this actually reminds me of one of the most uh, fascinating characters in Malaysian theatre in recent history that I've seen, uh, which is uh, Omar's uh, play Kandang, uh, where he turned, uh, where, or rather where he portrayed Squiller, the propaganda pig, uh, in the form of a campy uh, Malay talk show host. Uh, and, and it reminds me of how, uh, even in Malaysia or even in many contexts, queer characters, campy characters, uh, minor, minority characters can be uh, adopted uh, as mouthpieces, you know, and, uh, be, and then become signposts to say, see, you know, if you learn to speak the uh, language or you learn to play the game, uh, you can be successful too, right? And, and this reminds me, of course, of what uh, Fami said then uh, about how he has to learn the script uh, in Parliament. So where do we... Uh, as, as we progress, right, in the arts and politics, you know, it's always about learning some scripts. How do we resist the script taking over our own voice, right? Where is the point of the artist interrogating himself or herself? Uh, and also, does the artist interrogating himself or herself involves opening up the artist to be interrogated by others. Because we cannot look at the question of interrogating the political through the arts without also acknowledging how the political are constantly trying to use the arts, right? And therefore us. So, so where does the reverse uh, view happen? Anyone want to tackle this? Sorry, can you do a shorter version of that question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you learn the script, but how do you resist the script becoming the only thing you ever end up saying, right? How do you also resist becoming the signpost of that minority character or the outcast that becomes adopted to say that, look, things are fine if you learn this script? Like many politicians end up uh, in power, right? I mean, if you look at the parliament, it's almost as if half of them are in danger of being seduced by Hazik, you know? so. So how, how, do, how did these people end up in this position of power except for learning the scripts of privileges by utilizing those scripts, right? But now that they are in there, have they done anything to subvert those scripts? Or has the script taken over their place? <coughs> Five seats for them, there was like a lot. 
Okay, so so the, 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 the Institute of Policy Studies, which is the national policy uh, you know, think tank, uh, then decided to do this project on what will happen to Singapore 10 years later, what kind of governance do we want? So I remember when I did that, you know, some some people from the the, the NGOs from civil society they was a bit upset that you know, hey, were you appropriated? Uh, were you co-opted? Now, in one particular artwork, which was very interesting, was uh, we were looking at model politician. So we did a cutout, and we allow people to paste values that attach to model politicians. And I remember the 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 director of Institute of Policy Studies, who was also who is also the chief communication officer of the government, you know, was walking around the exhibit with me. And then he saw this. Right, this model, you know, so we have a cutout, you know, and, and this model uh, politician, right at the crotch area, someone put, must have balls. <laughs> and so he took a photo of it. Then I was like, is he going to take this down? And the next thing is, I think he sent to some of his colleagues and other politicians. He didn't ask me to take it down. And if he had asked, I wouldn't want to take it down also. I think uh, how you create the work, at least for me, uh, is as, as an artist, I, I do have a strategy, but, but that doesn't take away the, the agenda that I have. Okay, I, I do have my own agenda when I make that work, and must acknowledge my own agenda. But at the same time, how do I, I, my question to myself has always been: How do I create a space so that you know it? Like I said, the senses. How do I actually have the senses there? Uh, and and that then opens up that possibility of the work, not you know, not being uh, ordered only by a particular voice. So that's my approach. But I'm not so sure uh, when you are in politics. How you play that game? Because in the end, what is the end game to be a politician? I mean, this is a question I ask myself. So, what is the end game to be a very good politician, or to be someone who will question politics and question power and then make change? I think that that really depends on how that politician uh, find his or her way through this and how to mediate that. And the scary thing is that you can't do it alone also. <coughs> How you do it with a group of people? Yet all have their own agendas. Uh, I really have no answer to it, but my experience there has not been, personally, I don't feel good uh, being in the parliament. Uh, <laughs> <or best. laughs> uh, maybe because I am not really a politician. I think I see myself more as a practitioner. I'm not interested in the talking of it, but I'm not interested in the practice of it. If politicians say that their work is to make changes, yeah, okay, then how do they convert words into action? Uh, but as an artist, I can. That's why I, I now call what I do more as a practice rather than a creator of a work. So how do I practice this process of constantly reflecting myself, which is important because then you ask yourself, will you be co-opted? And yeah, there are moments that I, I, I would say that yes, I'll be co-opted by certain things. Then can I navigate myself away from it and find some other means to respond to it? I just want to add that um, I think that it takes you know, horses for courses in a way, in the sense that they, you make decisions about how far out from the center you want to be in terms of um, engaging and developing new scripts or scripts, and you choose how much you wish to be co-opted or how much you wish to be within uh, uh, to learn how the power would work, because I think sometimes 
you know, the, 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 the clarity around, a, you know, a binary uh, difference is, is too, it's not much like the truth. It's, it's a lot messier. But I think in terms of support for people who want to create the alternative script, uh, I, I feel there is, a, there is a slight difference, although it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not an obvious one. I mean, if I think, for example, that um, some of the work that was done by Pete Tridel in the 1990s of work that is kind of education around HIV, AIDS, and sexuality, that there wasn't that much engagement and uh, uh, association with other NGOs of different uh, priorities, but I feel no, there were some solid allies at the time, but I feel that now there are more. Uh, I don't know if that's kind of my you know, fantasy, but I, I think that that's true. But by the same token, now we have um, a kind of incredible performativity around video, sex videos, and um, how we are going to ever get uh, you know, we get wise to this, but each time there's a really interesting thing. So now we have, you can have a video that's authentic, but we can't verify who's in it. You know, and then we, we get caught up into that kind of uh, uh, um, uh, use of good old LGBTQ issues to distract us from other things to, to make. But in this case, I think that we really do have a power conflict that is... Uh, of course, while we still have mainstream media that are not owned by uh, the prevailing government, then, then you know, this is going to be fuel for fire. But I think there is a change around on-the-ground kind of alliances for support for different uh, uh, scripts. Um, but it's very difficult while the opposition would pounce on anything that is LGBTQ+, uh, uh, plus, and then so we have to be really clever about how to get around it, uh, how to circumvent some of these um, issues. And so it continues on I me, mean, the creativity. Uh, we'll take one question and two questions here. I think we'll take two at a time. That'll be easier. Um, I'm Mustafa. Hi, Wabi. Um, I'm actually looking at it in a different light and since you all arts in the arts world okay uh, in my opinion that political is actually about convincing people you actually want to change game changer so i think uh, for malaysia baru we need a game changer you know what happened in indonesia after jokowi took over in 2014 he didn't go to the same route what he said is arts can actually unite people it can be also an industry that can give food on the table as well as convince the country and also the people. So, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, you have the Majlis Rekha Bentuk in Mosti. You have the Majlis Seni in Ministry of Culture and Arts. We have in 2009, Dasar uh, what, uh, Industry Creative Negara, but nobody knows where is it. And we cannot even find that. No, what he did in 2014, he united all 17 subsectors of creativity, which includes the arts, the filmmaker, the book writer, architecture, cartoonists, even the digital things, all in one and move the new economy. Forget one industry because it takes by itself. So I don't know why be whether if it could be the game changer that we are looking for, use arts as an advocate and also use arts as economic generator. Because that's political, right? You are actually convincing people, both sides, opposition or your side. And also to convince the financiers, bankers. Because right now, bankers are not seeing arts as an investment. They're looking at arts as a liability to them. So I don't know, because I'm an architect, so I just, you know, because I just came in from another talk with talking about this sort of thing as well. So. You know, I think we need an industry that has under one umbrella. You know, in Indonesia, they, got, they call it Badan Economy Creative Indonesia. Last year, they conducted the first ever world conference on creative economy. No Malaysians went there, but other countries went, 140 countries went. And they're going to do the second one. Are we going to be there or just be the bystander? So I think it is the arts 
wherever arts lah, it will be the game changer and I think it will also be politically right because it, it is naturally neutral, both ways. Okay, I, so I don't know, you are from the government, if you can do that, I think everybody will just help you. Okay, I, you do my part, I do my part, book, book making, uh, we are for it. Thank you. Chaku Vadaketh. Um, just wanted to say thank you for sharing so much uh, with us of your own work. And I think uh, the message that f strikes me most is that the arts and performing arts, I think is what uh, all of you are p primarily involved in, shines a light on what's happening in our society and probably not the best bits of our society. But uh, I think happy families and child sexual abuse and at the time, my mother, oh, I'm not Anjay, <laughs> I'm not An Lee here. <laughs> okay, um, and, you know, sexual abuse or uh, people dying alone in, in the flats and uh, unbridled power and corruption. But what struck me is that, like, Happy Families was some 30 years ago, and uh, Omar, your plays, which I found were immensely powerful and brave, which just happened recently. But what struck me, the similarity is that the audience reach is so tiny that so few people go to see these plays. And whether it's Kandang or it's Tato Sri, you know, it was a small theater, tickets were sold out. I had to sort of pull cables to try and get in. Um, and, you know, uh, so is there any way in Malaysia Baru that there's a that people can get to know about these plays, there's bigger audience, there's bigger theatres. Uh, how can we do that? 30 years down the line, it's the same small little community and these important messages are being told so beautifully, so cleverly, so powerfully, but how can people get to see them? How do people know about it? Um, uh, so I think that's a very important issue. I'm currently working on some workshops in Sentul uh, with kids and these kids, have never seen a play. So we're trying to get them to set up their own English drama group. Uh, but the sad thing is that teachers, I think, have never seen a play. And the kids are very enthusiastic, but the teachers who are supposed to take this project on are just not attending even. They came on the first workshop, they made a token appearance, and they've just not come back. Because one teacher sits at the back, she's there all the time, but she's looking at her phone most of the time, and upset that none of the other teachers are there. So, you know, how do we get that, you know, there has to be some kind of, can the Minister of Education, the Minister of Culture and Tourism, or Tourism and Culture, Minister of Communication, because I think performing arts, visual arts, film and television, can they all come together and maybe can we, if it's not interrogate politicians about the arts, maybe have a dialogue, and can that be a part of the new vision of Malaysia Baru? so that we, the, the community in that particular field, can talk to the politicians about it and come to a consensus of how we can move forward. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want to take that? I'll just quickly, the two, two questions, uh, Mustafa's question on, on bringing every, every, all of these different agencies. For example, you know, Masa Mustaka, the so-called custodian, yeah? the, the custodian of uh, Bahasa Melayu, Bahasa Malaysia, uh, it sits under the Ministry of Education. Pepustakaan Negara, the National Library, sits under the Ministry of Education. Uh, and you mentioned it's now Majlis Seni Reka. Reka Bentuk is under, not Mosti now, it's under Mestek. I don't know whether it's still there or where. Then you've got Finas and you've got all of these other uh, communications and multimedia. And then you've got uh, everything else, yeah? forming arts and etc. Uh, Balai under uh, Motek. Uh, I have, at least for me, in Parliament, raised the, the need to either have an interministerial effort between all of these ministries that affect all of these different uh, arts-making bodies or, 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 you know, like practitioners in different fields. Um, and, you know, depending on the minister or the ministers, yeah, um, some of them are not plussed about it, some of them are like, yeah, it's a great idea, and kind of, you know, I have to remind them every time. I'm not a minister yet, so, you know, I, there's only so much that I can do for the time being. But, um, at the same time, you see, for example, uh, someone 
said, you know, like I think you mentioned that Anwar, you know, might might be able to shift somewhat. And we saw a little bit of this when, for the first time, um, the the six uh, Sinema Negara were given lifetime uh, allowances, monthly allowances, which has never happened before. And some people said, why? Know, people questioning why are you giving five thousand ringgit a month to these six people? Why are you? Why is it the Minister of Finance? Why is it not you know the Minister of Education? Because literature, for example, sits under Ministry of Education. But I think at least there's some open there. There's supposed to be the the presentation of a new nat national cultural policy, Nasa uh, Negara. Um, the minister has promised that at least for me that, that you know I, you can be briefed about it. Um, so we'll, we'll wait and see. I know that uh, efforts by friends, including like Reformatsi and, and, and all, uh, these need to be heard by parliamentarians, they need to understand the issue. So what I'm proposing is that um, um, for members of, of the audience or arts practitioners, people who are interested in policy making, uh, come to parliament. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in. I, I have brought some people in to see the architecture, uh, to, to see the, the design inside. Uh, and, and to actually witness what happens inside. But I think more concerted effort, engaging policy makers. And, and one of the, the issues that we have is that if we were to put everything under one roof, you know, the, the joke that I have said on record, on in the headset, in parliament, is that, yes, it's great that we have something like Puspa, for example, it's a one-stop center. You go there one time, stop already. <laughs> you know, that's a joke line. Actually, actually, in uh, Chako's question about bringing more people, actually we have, you know, I, I learned when, when I was looking at the Auditor General's report the other day, for example, Chidana, the entity uh, that was given 20 million ringgit in 2017, was supposed to be encouraging and bringing more of these school children uh, to schools, I mean, to, to watch plays, for example. Um, but uh, the, the Auditor General's report on uh, migrative ventures and Chandana is something that you can look online and you can uh, gauge for yourself. We have some people who are part of Chandana here as well, so I think you can talk to them if you know who they are. Um, beyond that, uh, to me, when it comes to arts making, kalau ada, kalau tak ada, you can still do to some extent, right? I mean, we look at the work around here, you know, some of the works, uh, Hoi Chong and all, you know, despite despite whether there is or is not, to me at least art can still make one. You can still make. But um, the role of government, if it were up to me, is to incorporate uh, the, the, the voices into a, a national conversation. I think that's, that's giving it that space, that's, that's the most valuable aspect of, of um, arts making. Okay, and uh, just to quickly answer Mustafa's question or uh, comment, I think it's safe to say that after many years of a bloated civil service having developed in the last few decades, and lots of ministries being created with lots of ministerial portfolios to fulfill certain functions which we don't know, just because to marshal up a large cohort for the previous uh, regime, I think now to talk about cutting back and scaling back, it's, 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 it'll take time. Because these are people's jobs, if you want to cut jobs, I think the for me the goal, the way forward is to actually streamline. Because why are they sitting in all sorts of different ministries? Because there are so many different ministries to begin with. Why are there so many different ministries? It's because of you know the, the previous past few decades of how this has been going on. So if you want to cut back, I think it takes time, I think it takes political will. It obviously also has to think about electorates, because if you cut people's jobs, these are people who are not going to vote for you in the next election. So, you know, all that is kind of like inter intermeshed. I mean, in a weird way, with the push towards catching people who are corrupt, it's a great way to streamline. On that note, I'm going to take two other questions who are here first on this, these two gentlemen, and then end here. Oh yes, sorry, okay. Uh, I'll just take these three first, then I'll come back later. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Um, hello, uh, my name is Sufi. I'm from Dang it. Alright, so it's a cursed microphone, so yeah. yeah. Testing. Okay, um, first of all, I'm interested with all the ideas that we presented, and I'm a PhD student and I'm doing currently on 
the relationship between Malaysia and the United Kingdom through visual art and the idea of how visual art is the main catalyst for the relationship between two countries especially with the recent British Council report on the creative hubs in Malaysia and how, in essence, the last part of the report says that Malaysians' uh, creative hubs are all grassroots levels and they're all passionate about it, but there are no financial incentives and especially there are no government or political effort to navigate where these um, sort of like um, initiatives are doing. So my question is actually, especially when Juan An uh, mentions about the possible Islamization um, during uh, possibly Anwar becoming Prime Minister. So this reminds me of what the Dasa Kebrayat back in the 1970s, uh, which actually is not really an actual Dasa Kebrayat, if I'm not mistaken. It's just a collection of essays and you know proposals. But there has been quite a, a mis, uh, sort of like a mixed reaction. Some say it's for the visual art, it's a rediscovery of identity, how the Angkatan Sini, uh, Angkatan Sini Malaysia were all about finding their identity, about the revival of Batik. Others is about it's, the policy is quite non-inclusive as well because it's about uh, Islam is a main component, said, fair to say, about the Dasa. So my question is actually, I mean, what are your perspectives, especially from YB and Juan Carmen, about the policy and about how it's impacted now? Because we are going to hear about the new Dasar, so we might as well look back in history as to what is it that we've learned, what has happened before, and how is it impacted now? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, gentlemen at the back. Thanks. Uh, my name is Nazrin. Uh, I'll make this very brief because I have two questions, very short. So to me, politics is a negotiation of it negotiation of interest and as a society we want the best outcome right so the first um, question is basically to what extent is the is art being political a symptom of actually the political system failing to create a space that is inclusive and responsive um, to the concerns of the citizens um, because it, it seems like there's a theme where art is adopting the responsibilities of politics uh, politics in itself is supposed to already be inclusive so like are we supposed to rejoice and celebrate when art is political because what does that mean? Because politics, the political system itself, is not um, serving this uh, function, right? And the second question is, it's related um, to an earlier question. Basically, um, art has a transformative capacity, um, but then the, act, the ability to interpret and experience art is currently very much a privilege in Malaysia. So as art practitioners or members of government, how are you um, thinking about or acting on democratizing access to art? Okay, actually, and I'm going to hold your question to join later because these are two very heavy questions. Okay, so the first is about national cultural policy. Uh, how do we feel going forward in terms of uh, what kind of policies or what should be put into the new policy? And the second one is two prong. Let me try and see if I can summarize that. One is is the fact that the arts is looking at politics a sign of the failure of politics to do its job, right? That's fair. Second is. Are you democratizing access to art? Okay, yes. Uh, can I just quickly answer the second question of the second gentleman? And that is uh, part of this, if you know, in the last year or so, uh, the, Ministry of, the Minister of Education has called for an expert committee to relook the national education policy. And one of the sections of that is to look at arts education. So uh, members of Reform Artsy and also some members of Fire Arts Centre, including Janet Pillay, who is here now, uh, is on that committee and basically there's a push to think about integrating arts education uh, formally into the curriculum from a very uh, young age, meaning from primary on until secondary, lower and upper. So if that proposal were to be approved at the ministry level and then go on to parliament, then the question of is it going to be democratized I think will be answered because now school children will learn about arts very early stage and we're not just going to talk about drawing and music which is also not taught across the board in all schools <coughs> and possibly if it's going to be taught across all schools then secondary level we are hoping to think about arts appreciation, arts criticism, the kinds of things that you have just mentioned would be taught at a higher level but that all will take 20 years. I mean, even if we were to start next year, all that will take time to get to where you are proposing to go. Um, any, but anybody want 
to have. Uh, I think I think we need to interrogate the minister. No. <laughs> so actually, actually no. But honestly speaking, I think that would probably be the most fair uh, because uh, we don't know as much about how this new uh, Dasa Kudayan Nagara, uh, what form, what shape, how is it different from uh, the document produced in 1971 or 72 that included papers from Piramli, etc. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, what's important is, like to me, okay, if you look at, at how I, I um, uh, when you look at, say, participatory democracy, uh, even though in the case of Dasar Kebudayaan Negara, I'm not able to kind of help open the door, but at least when you look at my constituency, which is Lembah Pantai, uh, when it comes to things like, say, City Hall, DBKL, yeah, uh, I tried to make sure that where there was initially no engagement at all, so as the MP, I would say, no, I want to have this engagement. I want you to come and hear the residents out on a particular issue, whether it's local or it's... it's uh... So uh, I think the same kind of process needs to happen for major public policy. In fact, um, what Carmen was saying about things taking time, uh, the kind of changes that we want to see in the Malaysian parliament uh, also will take a long time. I sit in the... Uh, special the, the parliamentary special select committee on human rights and gender equality and there's so many things that we want to do there's so many issues that we want to tackle statelessness hu uh, you know like sexual harassment a range of issues but it, it just feels like wow the doors are open and we can do everything but then to do the most basic things even that takes time we are beginning to understand how government machinery works i mean for me and, and I agree with Carmen, you know, it, 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 there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you kind of like have to be patient with it. So politics is not partisan politics, party politics, and being a, an elected representative is not, maybe it's not for everybody. You do need to have a high threshold for, for some kind of pain, <laughs> you know, and, and you have to hold back. Uh, you know, your emotions or whatever it is, like for example, being called out on uh, uh, the issue of portraits in, in Parliament, you know, you, I could easily lash out, but no, that's not, that's not the point. Uh, and, and we have to be open to criticism. The best thing about the current cohort of parliamentarians, out of 222, 89 are first term parliamentarians. About 10% are under the age of 40, 14% are women but the 10% under the age of 14 will most likely survive and, and you know, will, will serve for a while. So as we phase out the, the older cohort, the older group of MPs, uh, the reality is that when we've reduced the minimum age of voting to 18, you're going to get a completely new group of voters who will inadvertently push parliamentarians to get new scripts to speak a different language. Just think about it, five years ago, MPs don't even know what selfies are, <laughs> right? So five years from now, you know, you might get your first 18 year old member of parliament for better or for worse. Uh, but I think when you look at say Westminster and how it took hundreds of years to change, in Malaysia, we have to kind of look at the scale uh, and, and you know, uh, keep keep chipping away at the block. That to me, you know, is what like Marie de Cruz always reminds. You know, it's difficult, but you have to keep chipping away at the block. And sometimes I have to kind of rein myself in because you want to do so much and you feel like, oh my God, tapi you can suffer, and you have to like, okay, we are, we can do so much uh, now, more now than than we can uh, than we could before. Uh, I just wanted to add to, to your comment that, um, and in relation to what you've just said, Fami, you know, for the inch by inch, although you mentioned Dr. Um, Kowi for, for, for the credit for um, marshalling all of the energy, I think he could do that because Marin Pangestu before him had laid out a lot of uh, uh, the, both the strategic planning 
and had carried out in a very kind of committed, detailed, and imaginative way uh, to be able to move um, industry, to, to get people to think differently about what industry was, to get people, even for, you know, the batik and so on, to create new ways of, of um, what has been traditional ways of doing things. So I think just to, to, to say that it is positive, it, it does happen, it's just, I think, um, slow but sure, and it needs individuals to, to, to be sure that they are driving it uh, and not to drop the ball or, you know, um, and, and have more support on the ground uh, as well from all relevant publics. I would like to respond to the gentleman's first question about uh, uh, yeah, art sort of replaced our place to deal with problems. I think there are actually different kinds of artists. There are just one group of artists who keep constantly asking themselves how would their work be relevant to, to what is happening to them. And that's why they will engage on those things. We still have artists who want to seek performs, seek for aesthetic uh, experimentations. And so you actually have a landscape of all this possibility. Then, for the people, for the artists who are working with, you know, trying to ask for their relevance, then when the, when the, when the landscape shifts, then this artist will have to ask himself or herself, how do you actually respond to that change? So I don't think, I think if it would be simple for us to just say that, hey, we're trying to replace politics, I, I don't think that is the purpose. So going back to the work of an artist, then uh, we really have different kind of artists. So I would ask myself, you know, if let's say five years later, there are a lot of theater companies or a lot of arts groups doing the kind of work that I'm doing. I would be asking if I would still be doing the same work. I don't have to do it just because I'm good at it. But the thing is that then I would ask myself, because I am in a way using uh, public resources, so how do I respond to it? To this and how do I then use these public resources to make work that would be meaningful to me or to you know the people that I'm speaking to? Uh, I think that's that 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 is uh, the way I'm, I'm thinking about that issue. And and I I concur with uh, Pami and N in the sense that you know bureaucracy is really a huge machine and actually most of the time you can't even see the entire machine because you don't know which part is not functioning. You know? <laughs> Seriously, and, and you, you really need to like, you can't be too clinical at the same time because there are humans there. You can't then go to that part and then just pull that thing out. Uh, especially, if, let's say, you, you, you want to be a politician who wants to listen to people. So you are struggling between efficacy, efficiency, and to be someone who wants to be as, as relational as possible and want to get outcome. And that's why time that becomes so important. But sometimes we don't know how long can people wait. No. Okay, I think we'll just move on. We'll take a question from Anne and then Ethan at the back there, yes. Or maybe you start first. Oh, we have the mic. Okay, good. Okay, Anne, yeah. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anne James. I'm a member of Five Arts Centre. Um, my question is in relation to something that Omar and Chako mentioned. Why does it feel like we are treading water 30 years on, in spite of the fact that we have uh, more theatre spaces, um, Chandana and various funding organisations, attempts to set up marginalises and things like that, to push, especially the performing arts, I think. I think the visual arts has made great leaps forward. And I'm just asking an opinion of the panel. Do you think the reason this government and the previous government could not articulate a position on arts because of Islam? In schools, it has become an issue. It, it, as a former school teacher, it was an issue constantly that, we, that the government is caught in a trap, even if they want to, they have to deal with an Islamic, whether it's major or minor, uh, minority, that has a very clear position. So until you rec reconcile the position between Islam and the performing arts, this country cannot move forward and have a, 
a situation where Djokovic can go and make a statement like that, or Singapore can have a position like us. We are finding it difficult because of that issue of race as a cycle. Okay, thank you. And yes. Yes, same issue here. Malaysia, beauty, multi-culture, multi-races. But uh, when we are facing government or the Taki Tangan, Gawai Gawai, they are um, sometimes they have their ways of doing things that they can't make it as a multi-races, multi-culture. So what we are facing is more tech when we talk from the activity and so on, yes, it's more majorly one of the races, but not so multi-culture, multi-races. Uh, another thing is uh, Dasa Kebudayaan Kebangsaan. Actually, the new theme of this policy, new policy is called Dasa Kebudayaan Kebangsaan. It changed the Angara uh, to Kebangsaan. So, what we heard is that uh, we, we, uh, I did uh, uh, go to the, 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 the meeting and, and with what we are and mengarahkan is the keberbagaian kebudayaan, multi-cultural but what we heard a meeting of the government agency the keberbagaian kebudayaan is not very diutamakan they take, maybe take it out so this is a worry of my, me then we then we are really waiting for the town hall meeting which we can next uh, August, mid of August. And if the paper come up, is no multi uh, multi culture. So what can we do, or what can I do? If so, uh, so to go to the contact or go to the each of the member of parliament one by one, or how can we take action as a person? Okay, I think those two questions are pretty good to start with. Maybe I'll just uh, maybe add on a layer to what Anne is asking. I think the, probably the incisive thing to say here is it's not religion per se or Islam per se, but it's because Islam has been an instrument for political power. If Islam was never used as an instrument for political power, I think we have a very different way of thinking or engaging religion, whether critical or not. But because it's used as an instrument of power, now you can't divest yourself of the same instrument you need to stay and maintain power. So I think that's where it gets like very, very tricky. Okay, so anybody want to tackle either or any of these questions? Can I jump in? Um, oh, this is the one that's bad. Okay, ah, all right, okay. Um, this actually is a particular uh, subject of particular interest of mine, especially when you talk about uh, uh, Islam, for example. And it's also uh, on a larger scale of uh, when we speak of culture, uh, because I, I believe this is exactly the kind of question. Uh, it's, a, it's a cultural question, you know, and, 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 and I would like to uh, also pose this question, the fact that we don't even have a ministry of culture, for example. Uh, you know, it's, it's part under, at one point it was under one ministry, you know, uh, the other was parked under tourism. Four times. Four times. Yeah. So, uh, what I mean is, you know, I mean, this is this is the question I have: Is are we not important? I mean, are we, not not are we. I mean, is our culture not important to us? These cultural questions, you know, and these are the questions that 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 we need to talk about. I mean, like like the role of Islam, for example, you know. And we do have that 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 problem. And and, and as a Muslim myself, you know, my my father, you know. Um, I learned Islam from, from seeing how my father practiced it. Uh, it's, it's an important question because we don't even talk about it. Like, uh, I mean, the, the fact that, for example, there are certain things, uh, I don't know if I, it's okay to say this here, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Uh, like, for example, like questions like uh, um, legally in this country, like for example, that we are not, um, that Muslims cannot marry uh, non-Muslims, for example. If we are true practitioners of Islam, for example, we would know that that is nonsense. That is nonsense. You know, uh, uh, legally we can. So you know, we say that we practice Islam, or Islam is the, the, the law of the land. But then, then again, we are not practicing it either. You know, we, we pick and choose. You know, what is uh, what is right, what is wrong. In Islam, so we talk about uh, there is no uh, uh, compulsion in religion. What happens to that, for example? You know, so so. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually a conversation that we need to have, and that's why I feel like, like you know, um, this is the conversations that, that the arts could have, that we can have a, you know, a, a space 
for us to talk about this because we need to talk about this because how long, uh, you, know, how are we, you know, how long are we just going to let things just sort of float and where are we going to go? You know, I mean, I mean, I'm sure like, you know, perhaps non-Muslims are afraid about the, you know, I mean, we talk about the Islamization of, of uh, Malaysia, for example. As a Muslim myself, I'm afraid. Uh, where, you know, and, you know, where are we going to go with this, you know? And are we going to take the, the, the most, and, and I say this because I, you know, in, I'm, I'm a Johorian, you know, and I went to school Agama, so I learned a bit about religion, you know, I mean, I mean so, so to me, it's, I see, you know, a lot of good values uh, from it, or possible good values, but instead what I see, what is implemented, is something so scary. It's, you know, and, and you know, as, as mentioned, as, as, as an instrument of, of power. And again, I think because, you know, uh, it is being used as an instrument of power, it is our responsibility uh, for us to, to, to question it. Um, um, and if, if I may just, just go back a bit, uh, 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 like, you know, with Dato Sri, for example, we talk about like how, uh, how power is, is in the realms of the elite, for example, or of a select few, and it just, you know, almost in Dato Sri, you don't even talk about uh, the people. Nobody cares about the people. And Kanang is, 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 is the opposite in the realization that, that, that it is us, the responsibility is us to question these things, uh, to participate. Uh, uh, and I, I, I believe um, um, we all have to, to I mean, is it possible to, to even, I mean, I, I, I don't even know how we can even engage in this, this, this conversation because it's not even allowed to. It's not, it's not legal if I'm not, not you know, to, 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 yeah, it's legal to talk publicly about it. But for, for you know, how, but how long are we going to, to just allow it to just sort of move on like this? Uh, and I feel, um, yeah, I, I, I just, I mean, in terms of hoping for the future, I think this is the kind of conversations that we really need to have. And but I, th I think it's at the same time uh, engaging in a manner that, that is responsible, I believe. Because sometimes, you know, Sometimes it becomes problematic when, when it becomes just just for the sake of, of uh, you know striking out, for example. And um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So this is where like tomorrow's utusan Malaysia, <laughs> ahli parlimen lembah pantai duduk dalam forum bersama orang yang sekian sekian. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, um, I think I think uh, uh, like for example, uh, as as a parliamentarian, sixty three percent of my constituency <laughs> is Malay Muslim. Sixty three percent. Lembah Pantai is more has more Malays in terms of voters than Rantau, which was a uh, Mahasan punya constituency. So, to me. Uh, and you know, one of the things, one of the first things I did after becoming member of parliament is to fight to return the name Kampung Krinci, right? Not because of Islam, not because of Malays, not because of, but really because of a sense of place, a sense of uh, respect for uh, the the people, the community, the local local community. And the thing that I've learned uh, in the year and a half since becoming member of parliament, and in the ten years of you know, working in Lembah Pantai, is that, um, you know, we, we might say things like we are afraid or the, the growing, creeping, uh, so-called Islamization. But when you are actually on the ground, when you're actually in the PPRs, when you're actually in the Kampung, uh, the vantage point is very different. And I appreciate this, this very different um, how do you see it? The narratives can be so, so different. And when I'm on the ground, actually, art doesn't matter. To some extent, you know, religious belief is not really a consideration as much as it is about putting food on plates, as much as it is putting, making ends meet. So I have come to see that it's important to acknowledge this is where we are right now. We can't have a situation of tabula rasa. But where do we go from here? So it is, to some extent, a question of economics, a question of the economy. And I don't mean economy, economy only in the ringgit and cents sense. 
but also what is the role of the arts as an economy within that economy but also the political economy it's a complex discussion that warrants probably papers and, and etc uh, but a lot of it stems from when we say lack of dialogue lack of conversation it is built from years of uh, the, the, the trust gaps that have been allowed to widen. And I think in order to reduce this on a very human level, you know, there's only so much that each and every one of us, there's only so much that policies can do. There's only so much that bureau bureaucrats and, and uh, government agencies can do. Uh, there's only so much that an artwork, a performance uh, can do. So I think, you know, to, to kind of try and make sense, you want to change so much. But the most that I can do, at least as a member of parliament in Lebah Pantai, is to cultivate a slightly better understanding of difference. Uh, I had today a program since 8.30 a.m. And I will have until near midnight. That's regular. But in uh, today, I had programs in a PPR, a public housing project. I had programs in a very rundown, low cost area of Lembah Pantai, off Jalan Puchong. And I also had a program in the very wealthy and leaf leafy suburb of Bangsa. Three very contrasting sites, three very different audiences for my everyday quotidian performance as a member of parliament. But the thing, in every performance, what I try to cultivate in the PPR, it's about we launched a, a reading the Quran program that we provide free for 75 families. In Taman Sri Stosa, it was about getting the Commissioner of Buildings, so technocratic, Commissioner of Buildings to come and help talk about memorandum of transfer and getting your heart milit strata. In Bangsa, it was just about having safer communities. But in each one, the consistent role that I play is as a leader that in a, in a Malaysian, the artist Ilan, for example, writes about, you know, her works is about Orang Besar, yeah, the, the, the chiefs. So the role that I can play, and I mean that in a performative sense, is when you look at me, when, when you know, a Makci in a PPR, when an auntie in Bangsa, when, when you know, all the different people in Taman Sri Sosa, when they look at me, I want them to see that what I'm trying to do is bridge these gaps and try to uh, return trust. Uh, it's a difficult endeavor, and I can only do that in my constituency. Yeah? So very complex conversations, not something that we can answer sufficiently in the few minutes that we have left. Uh, but it is it's, it's an ongoing project. The thing that I have come to learn and see and accept is that you can't put your full faith in one thing, but you've got to kind of get chip away at the block. But if many of us do it at the same time, you know, I think we can have some kind of change. That's how we changed the government in the last elections. Okay, well said for me. And um, we have to have this dialogue, and it's very difficult because for the any time, at least. In media wise, you a non Muslim brings up the question, it's Diam, this is not your religion, you can't say anything about it. So I was thinking, um, because actually I mean it's all very sensitive, uh, of course, but you 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 know, you read um, in nineteen eighty seven, got a copy of the um, Quran from Abim because I needed to do research for a character. It's supposed to be a romance set in Kuching between um, a kind of like modern day, uh, uh, very activist a female character and um, her brother. And um, uh, uh, anyway, the point was I needed to find out more for myself uh, to see what kind of um, the best kind of information that Abim could give me. Uh, and, you know, since then, I also have been interested, I think, like a lot of people in terms of sort of the whole history of Islamic science and, you know, the contribution of uh, so much that in the kind of dark ages is the complete opposite. You know, all these kinds of myths around 
um, the truths of, of what an Islamic kind of history would be. Uh, and whenever, before it used to be Tawajin um, Nik Aziz and then Hadi Awang, whenever it's, you know, you, you cannot say anything, be quiet. I think most people won't say anything out of so many reasons. You know, it's a private matter, it's this, I'm not qualified. I'm the, but I've been trying to think of kind of what would be uh, a concept that I could have a conversation with um, Pranaji Hadi Awang once, kind of like maybe if he's, you know, coming out of the bathroom, I'm going into the bathroom, and you know, kind of, we sort of, how, how would we kind of, not in the same bathroom, yeah. Uh, um, how, how would we, how would I be able to speak with him about this issue? Because obviously, you know, it's got to be done with respect, it's got to be done with some understanding, uh, and, a hi you know, when you read a history of Islamic societies and how non-Muslims have been dealt with over the many hundreds of years, these are important references in terms of historical examples, but I was thinking, you know, it's, it's quite an interesting thing that, okay, how do I get the grounds to speak about Islam? Okay, if I am a, a, a citizen of a country which has Islam as the official religion, does that make me a Kachukan Muslim? If I say, yeah, I'm a citizen of that country, uh, it doesn't have to be my particular uh, uh, religion, it doesn't have to be mine, I'm not asking you to you know, read it, but just trying to think of different ways in which to bridge uh, this idea that you know you you cannot say anything uh, ab about this. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, I need to be able to find the grounds. I know it's political. It's a political place, and of course there are many grounds to say no, no, Kajukan Muslim. What are you? But I'm just putting it out there uh, that uh, as as an idea of trying to find ways to bridge uh, the difficulty of being able to talk about religion, and in particular for a Malaysian to talk about their official religion. Um, or national religion, how would you how would you do it? Maybe um, on my IC I can put them Kachukan Muslim, but you know, just not the real thing, but kind of blastran also, you know, uh, uh, some kind of terrible hybrid. Okay, and I think you're trying to be playful here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, we, we don't have a heck of a lot more time, so I'll just take two more, one at the back. Any more? Just one? Okay, yes, the gentleman standing up. Okay, yeah, I can't see, sorry, blocking. Okay, the two then, yeah. Uh, hi, Gerald here. Um, well, it's, it's not so much a question, but just a comment. Because uh, I, you know, I think we had a lot of questions today about, you know, what can government do for the art scene and uh, what role can government play uh, to, you know, develop a flourishing art scene in Malaysia. I, I just wanted to make the comment that, you know, actually we are in a privately funded, uh, free to public art gallery having this conversation. And I spend a lot of time in the Philippines. And, and in the Philippines, I mean, the art scene is very much driven by the private sector. Not, you know, government plays a role, but in, in not a huge way. And so I think my comment really is, you know, I think, you know, we don't always have to keep looking to the government to show leadership for the art scene, you know. What about the private sector as well? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, question, the next one, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Adrian. I run a human rights organization. Um, I was inspired to get involved in the arts and link human rights and, and arts after winning a Christian Jit Award. So, I was in, uh, were quite inspired. And I remember once we were in a room of arts uh, practitioners and uh, Janet also challenged us to, to not be shy to link arts with human rights. So me and my friends uh, struggle now uh, to bring arts to the migrant workers and it's a very difficult task. Uh, end of September, we are doing a migrant refugee poetry competition. And uh, I hope uh, one of the difficulties is getting Malaysians to to kind of connect with migrants and refugees. And the strange part is Malaysia is a country of migrants and migrants. Yeah? But uh, I'm not sure what happened throughout history. We now see a very big gap. So uh, maybe my question to Fami is how can uh, this new Malaysia 2.0, I, I don't like using Malaysia Baru because it's too vague. I use 2.0 so, so you can measure, you know. Um, so Fami, maybe 
how can uh, you know your mini the, the new government help us with this work? Yeah, thanks. It's like it's like I'm the I'm, <laughs> target. Practice. I'm a moderator, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really, really. Um, the first was just a comment actually about the government shouldn't be so uh, involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, on that point, um, right now, there are not enough tax incentives yeah, that would encourage more people in the private sector to come out and fund arts making. Uh, only right now, I think it's if you buy art, like paintings, particularly paintings and uh, things that you can put on a wall or something like that. Lah. Uh, but not so much about um, like the performing arts or literature. Of course, in, in literature, if you buy books, for example, you know, it, uh, currently we still, I mean, I'm encouraging the Minister of Finance to return the 1,000 ringgit tax uh, rebate or what uh, pelepasan cukai. When you buy books, they kind of combined it for this year, but for next year, I'm trying to, you know, that's one comment that I made. Um, yeah, but we need to have more tax incentives to uh, help um, private sector uh, to you know cultivate the arts. I think that that would be a good move. Um, that might be facilitated by having some kind of uh, 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 some kind of majlis lah. But we'll see. We'll see whether that can materialize. The question on migrant workers. Uh, I know that. Well, currently, uh, people. I think a lot of maybe the, the general public might conflate statelessness and, and uh, the issue of migrant workers and also asylum seekers. I think we, we oftentimes uh, misunderstand uh, which is what. And um, I've had various organizations come and make presentations and I know a little bit more only because I've been engaged um, a little bit more on this. I think um, the slow steps that the government can do uh, can only be taken in so far as we can reduce any anxiety that arises uh, out of the presence of migrant workers and asylum seekers here or refugees here in Malaysia. Because uh, I think the dominant narrative that is constructed in popular mainstream media is that for every job you know, that a migrant worker takes, then a local worker is deprived of this job. Whether that is true or not, you know, that, that's something which actually is, is not, the, the, the writing is not erudite enough, it's not uh, uh, precise or granular enough. Uh, I think what we need to do actually is, the, the biggest problem we have with human rights in Malaysia is that it is, a, it is a privileged language that we use to communicate human rights currently. It's English predominantly. So even for example, and I've raised this in at least in, in my own uh, things in, in parliament uh, and uh, even in uh, international fora, uh, like for example, Sisters in Islam, the name is in English. Of course, there's going to be, you know, on a very superficial level, uh, misunderstanding. Yeah? But the work that they do, I mean, even the fact that they got some grant was questioned. Like, why, why do you give to a divisive? But and at the same time, issues related to whether it's, you know, I sit in, in a committee on gender equality. So, of course, you know, we've had um, Jack come and give a presentation and a lot of the issues that have been raised. The question is, how can we vernacularize? How can we talk of issues, whether it's about uh, migrant workers or it's about uh, sexual harassment or it's about, you know, uh, uh, various minorities and ethnicities and concerns, these narratives, can it be in the vernacular? Can we appreciate? Can we speak more? So at least for me as a Five Arts member, the kind of um, working in the liminal or, or, or looking at that, that liminal space, the kind of in-between is, is very interesting. And even the work that, you know, Omar uh, and, and Kandang, for example, those kind of... Uh, uh, contradictions that we present on stage, I think uh, that has to happen more. But at the same time, we we need to be uh, speaking in in the vernacular, particularly. So I'm not just saying in Bahasa Malaysia or Bahasa Melayu, but also in Tamil, in in various dialects of Chinese. Uh, I'll give uh, an easy case, you know, uh, on issue of death penalty. Malaysia has has put a moratorium. 
and the government even the the you know when when we said we wanted to abolish mandatory death sentence which is not abolishing death sentence per se but loosening the the ties that bind judges on the issue of death penalty um, people interestingly like some MPs come to me and said you know in the Chinese press people are very upset that the government is and then you've got you know various people who come and say oh this is not entirely in line with Islam but then you realize actually people are talking about different things because it's not being communicated well so this is one thing which the government is itself is trying to address we've set up some some uh, team to, to kind of look at this um, so uh, to put it simply um, you know I will raise this with my superiors and my leadership and then <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll talk about this more thank you any other responses okay if not actually we are right on the money six o'clock uh, and I must say I thank all of you for your attention because it's historic. Uh, we rarely have any panel in the last three hours because Malaysian attention span can't take it, right? So you all, good job, good job. <laughs> um, okay, maybe by, by way of an ending, I will just read a quote. Actually, this is from a speech that uh, Heng Ruan gave to Singapore Parliament, parts of which I found were like really amazing. Uh, and I'll just read the parts that I liked, which I think might be very useful here to moving forward and thinking of what we're going to do next. So this is the quote, it says, Living together in a tight space means difficult questions should not be raised for fear that some people might not be ready enough to be engaged. And art raises difficult questions. How does one innovate if one does not ask hard questions? How does one innovate if one has to keep seeking permission to be playful, permission to transgress, permission to make mistakes? Our culture rewards results and success, but art promotes process and the value of failure. And it is precisely these intrinsic aspects of art that can help empower us to create a diversified, creative and sustainable future. Art can prepare us to engage critically with wisdom and empathy. So with that, thank you for participating. Hope you enjoyed the panel. Short announcement, we have books on sale at a very special price today. Normally 90 ringgit, today only 70 ringgit. So please buy our books. Thank you very much. <laughs>